with a corrupt government that is controlled by private financial interests. Of course, there are Zionists that have infiltrated our government, our State Department in particular, and the Pentagon, and they're also all over the media. Four were involved in a plot to send hate-filled posters like this one to the homes of journalists and activists, many of them Jewish. I think Hitler dealt with the Jews of Germany the same way he dealt with all traders, the same way we will. Same people who created the Federal Reserve the Rothschilds, the Rockefellers. The Christians have allowed spiritual forces to plunder the blood-bought treasures of Western civilization. At the very front of this video, I want to leave a disclaimer for intense depictions of anti-Semitism, including caricature, historical paintings of political violence, and real photos of political violence. Viewer discretion is advised. Anti-Semitism, or the ingrained conspiracies focused on spreading hate for Jewish people, is not a rational response to modern issues, yet it's one that more and more seem to be resorting to. Conspiracies have always been a way for many to make sense of the inconsistencies in society and the world around us, casting real-world issues through a fictionalized lens. The moon landing isn't real, is a ridiculous thing to say, of course, but when you throw in the idea that Stanley Kubrick filmed it with the US government, does that make it more plausible? No, but the fiction surrounding the conspiracy becomes a bit richer nonetheless. And for those inclined towards conspiracies, talks of secret cabals controlling commerce, satanic elites drinking the blood of children, lizard people, and ancient societies taking away our freedoms all working behind the scenes yet still in plain sight, lay the groundwork for dense labyrinths of lore. Lore that is often incomprehensible to parse if you're not part of the special group that believes the conspiracies, yet have decades of study around aliens, men in black, clandestine government organizations, and other unexplained phenomena reveal anything, it's that conspiracy theorists love their lore. They love a good story, even if it's one they fabricate themselves from bits and pieces that are only tangentially related. The relationship of these stories to modern issues then draw in curious adherents willing to learn more. We've talked about it before in videos like my Sound of Freedom review, how even well-meaning outsiders can be drawn into conspiracies like QAnon from movies that simply talk about human trafficking. The pandemic was a breeding ground for this phenomenon, seeing plenty of otherwise normal and well-adjusted people fall into rabbit holes about 5G cell towers, COVID vaccines implanting microchips to control the masses, mask mandates being a new world order bid for control, and plenty other conspiracies both more and less extreme. Of course, none of these are true. But that hasn't stopped people from believing them, and even more worryingly, it hasn't stopped parts of those conspiracies from leaking into mainstream political discourse. If not, explicitly than at least in spirit. Such is the case too with anti-Semitism, which might just be the world's oldest conspiracy theory. Like COVID denialism, vaccine skepticism, and QAnon conspiracies, anti-Semitism is so deeply rooted in various tangents, obscure history, and decades of anti-Semitic propaganda that the average person might not even know it when they see it. In diving into the full history of anti-Semitism and how it spread, my hope is that the tropes will be easier to recognize, as will recognizing who benefits from spreading conspiracies that target outgroups. For example, terms like globalism are thrown around by mainstream commentators, but do you know the way fears about globalism and world control have been derived from centuries-old anti-Semitic superstition? Like most conspiracies, these words and ideas are slippery slopes meant to tempt the curious with deeper knowledge that will reveal the true nature of the world at least according to those spreading the lies. For those who find themselves concerned about globalists taking over the world after hearing Trump or Alex Jones fearmonger, it might not be long before they're looking up the word. And from there, the growing sphere of online extremism can lead to any number of nasty places. Soon they may be asked questions about who really controls the world. They'll be shown obscure anti-Semitic texts that explain the origins of the Fed, national debt, the Rothschilds, who's running Disney, look at what they all have in common. For many conspiracies, anti-Semitism is an inevitable intersection, where the theorists come to posit Jewish control as behind this new world order. Anti-Semites like to pose these issues as a question, specifically the Jewish question, or JQ, which asks why Jewish people seem to be in such high positions of government control, influence in media, banking, and politics, and why we can't draw attention to that fact. Or at least, that's what the people asking the JQ would like you to believe. 
They love to ask these questions, and when they get shut down for the thinly veiled bigotry they're spreading, they try to frame it as being censored or just asking questions. It's an issue of free speech, you see. Look no further than Kanye West's series of recent public breakdowns for how the alt-right likes to spin these conversations. We will get further into Ye, Nick Fuentes, the alt-right effort to push anti-Semitism and racism into mainstream conservatism, and Zionism in a bit, but there's a lot to cover with Judaism first. For those who don't know, Judaism is an Abrahamic religion originating in the Bronze Age. Jews follow the Hebrew Bible called the Torah. Over the years, there have been a massive assortment of additional written commentaries from Jewish scholars and rabbis, which have become central to modern practices to varying degrees. There's also the Talmud, an assortment of ancient practices passed down for generations that has remained central to Rabbinic Judaism. Judaism is an ethno-religion, which means you can be Jewish by religion, ethnicity, or both. There are a wide variety of religious practices, with more conservative sects that adhere more fervently to tradition, referred to as Orthodox Judaism, and less conservative sects such as Reform Judaism. There are also others like Conservative Judaism and Reconstructionist Judaism. It should be noted for the purposes of this video, though, I am talking from a very Western perspective, and there are plenty of different Jewish groups, even beyond Orthodox and Reform, outside of that perspective, such as Mizrahi and Sephardi Judaism. But what makes Jews unique among faiths is that the term Jews can also describe an ethnic group descended from the Jewish diaspora, which we will get to in a moment. But first, we need to go back to the beginnings of anti-Semitism, like, all the way back. Because for many, seeing how topics of anti-Semitism get shut down might inspire a sympathetic view towards those being shunned. It does seem awfully suspicious that you can't talk about these things, and who's responsible, doesn't it? But that's because most people don't know the history of anti-Semitism, how it spread through thousands of years of superstition and tribalism, and when viewed in totality, the plight of the Jewish people takes a vastly different tone. By doing a deep dive through the history of anti-Semitism, I hope to make a video that answers the Jewish question, not by investigating why so many Jewish people are associated with every great tragedy or happenstance, or why there are so many Jews in power, but by thoroughly examining the bigotry against them for thousands of years. In the process, I hope to help people realize that intolerance hasn't changed much. Despite all our advancements as a species, many of our prejudices are still inherently ridiculous. This isn't meant to be a conversion for the fervent anti-Semites out there, because like most conspiracies, it's not a mere beast, but a hydra. Every way you disprove it, conspiracists will find 10 ways to show how that disprove actually proves them right, down to simply saying evidence has been fabricated by the Jewish order controlling everything. Conspiracy theories like Jewish control, the Illuminati, and the New World Order have been molded by so many different hands for so many different ends through the decades, there's always some backup reason, some great piece of evidence that will evade even the most well-reasoned arguments disproving these ideas. But as I hope to show through this intensive work of research, these conspiracies aren't based in tangible fact or history, but ideology and agenda. Deborah E. Lipstadt put it well in her book Denying the Holocaust. Here, she describes Holocaust deniers, but I feel her words can adhere to nearly any long-running conspiracy, particularly one as ahistorical as those against Jewish people. Quote, Reasoned dialogue, particularly as it applies to the understanding of history, is rooted in the notion that there exists a historical reality that, though it may be subjected by the historian to a multiplicity of interpretations, is ultimately found and not made. The historian does not create, the historian uncovers. The validity of a historical interpretation is determined by how well it accounts for the facts. However, even the historian with a particular bias is dramatically different from the proponents of these pseudo-reasoned ideologies. The latter freely shape or create information to buttress their convictions and reject as implausible any evidence that counters them. They use the language of scientific inquiry, but theirs is a purely ideological enterprise." End quote. Before we get to the meat of this video, I want to talk about some of the research I used for this essay. You think so soon after James Summerton, I wouldn't bring it on the research? Oh, I'm bringing it on the research. For my research, I sourced a plethora of academic papers, museums, libraries, websites, videos, and more, all of which will be available in a Google Doc linked below. This video covers literally thousands of years of human history, and there's no way to dive deep into every subject, no matter how personally fascinating I found them. So if you're curious about Visigoth rule in 7th century Spain, check out the sources and research for yourself. Throughout, I will cite direct quotes from several books I read for research. I've tried to use these quotes sparingly, but some of them so succinctly get to the heart of what I'm talking about, they may pop up a lot. 
The books I read are We Need to Talk About Anti-Semitism by Rabbi Diana Fersco, Denying the Holocaust and Anti-Semitism Here and Now, both by Deborah Lipstadt, Jewish Space Lasers by Mike Rothschild, and A Convenient Hatred, The History of Anti-Semitism by Phyllis Goldstein. I'll bring them up again, but I particularly recommend the last three because the depth of the history and research discussed within are just so far beyond what would fit in this video, and they're each incredibly valuable as resources to understand the totality of anti-Semitism through the years. Because these are very sensitive issues, I have done my best to tread respectfully, though I would still ask for patience because I'm sure I will get a minor date or pronunciation wrong here and there. Like I said, I am covering a lot in this one. I also want to thank a number of editors who have helped me with my script, including Jewish members of my community. Mia Warshawski, Tal Engel, Aileen Altman, Jem, and fellow content creator Lady Knight the Brave. I'd also like to thank Patrick Dune for helping me get in touch with Yadida Kanfer, who is Director of Programming at the JFCS Holocaust Center in San Francisco, and of course I want to thank Yadida for generously taking the time to look the script over as well. Much like Judaism itself, anti-Semitism can be hard to define. It takes many forms and can be aimed at ethnicity, religion, or both. It can refer to a series of negative stereotypes and conspiracies of varying depth and complexity, all of which I will try to explain here, but broadly, Anti-Semitism refers to prejudice against the Jewish people for any flimsy old reason. I want to say right here that there is a delineation to be drawn between anti-Semitism and critique of the Israeli government. While you absolutely can, and in my opinion should, criticize Israel for the inhumane treatment of Palestinians, especially those in Gaza right now, it has become in vogue for that criticism to come from anti-Semites, using the current social relevance of Palestinian suffering to push their bigoted ends. This includes both right and left-wing accounts on Twitter who have been spreading anti-Semitic conspiracies often attached to what seem like reasonable condemnation of Israel's military action against a civilian populace. There are populations of Jewish people all over the world, and with that variation comes a variety of different opinions on things like the Palestine conflict. Assuming someone is for Palestinian occupation just because they're Jewish is, in and of itself, anti-Semitic, as there are plenty of people who are pro-Israel and against the attacks on Palestine. It is behavior more people need to watch out for because, as I'll show, these kinds of flimsy accusations have been lobbed for hundreds, if not thousands of years, and rarely do they turn out to be true. However, they're almost always used to profit from the suffering of the Jewish people. And I do want to say, at the end of this video, I do do a very deep dive into the history of the Israel-Palestine conflict, but I wanted to get this out of the way up front. With that preamble done, let's give a brief overview of the history of anti-Semitism, starting in the century after the death of Christ. The relationship between Judaism and Christianity is still a point of contention. While the Torah describes many of the same events as the modern Christian Bible, it is organized differently. Moreover, the Jewish people don't recognize Christ as a Messiah. In fact, they barely recognize him at all. If you've seen my videos where I went undercover in the NIFB hate church, you'll know there are radical preachers teaching rabidly anti-Semitic doctrine that the Jewish people hate Jesus and that they killed Christ and God himself hates them. This isn't really true, by the way. The Jews don't really talk that much about Christ, and every Jewish person I've talked to on this has found it funny how much this brand of radical modern Christianity seems to think that Jews think about Christ a lot. For modern purposes, I will be starting with 70 AD and the Jewish people being forced from Jerusalem by the Roman army. After a Jewish revolt, inspired by unfair taxation and imperialist practices, was crushed by the siege of Jerusalem. For two years, Rome starved and isolated the Jewish people living inside. Finally, Vespasian assaulted the Jewish rebels and destroyed the sacred site of the Second Temple. Today, the Western Wall or Wailing Wall of the Temple still stands and has become a well-known prayer site. In the wake of Jerusalem's fall, hundreds of thousands of Jews were driven from their home or taken into slavery. This creates what becomes known as the Jewish diaspora, when the Jewish people were driven from their traditional homeland and began to settle in other areas of the Roman Empire throughout Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. This diaspora included the Ashkenazi that settled in northern Europe and the Sephardic Jews that settled in modern-day Spain and Portugal. It's a primary reason we have so much diversity in Judaism today. The diverse movements in Judaism were also influenced by the 18th century Jewish Enlightenment, also called the Haskalah, and efforts towards Jewish emancipation, but we will get to all of that. Because of the widespread of this diaspora, the genealogy of the Jewish people would become incredibly diverse after this point. The scattering of the Jewish people for over a thousand years would become a major motivation for political Zionism and the movement for a Jewish homeland. 
In the year 312, Constantine would declare Christianity as the official religion of the Roman Empire, leading to what would become Roman Catholicism. After the collapse of the Roman Empire in the 5th century, Jews would be just as miserable as everyone else in Europe for a couple hundred years among warring tribes of Visigoths, Huns, Franks, and others. As Catholicism ascended and spread across Europe, and regional conflicts and temporary empires dotted the timeline, Jews would fall under scrutiny from the church, or more accurately, a series of rulers adhering to a volatile and tribalistic form of Christian dominionism. For example, in France around 626 or 629, I couldn't really tell, King Dagobert declared that if Jews didn't convert to Christianity, they would be put to death. Sometimes it would be religious leaders driving it, like in Spain, the various councils of Toledo meetings from the 400s to the 700s set a path for anti-Semitism to flourish driving deep divides between Jews and Christians, forcibly taking Jewish children, and mandating baptism for babies from mixed Jewish-Christian couples. There were more extreme measures, like the banning of Jewish rites and rituals under penalty of death at the stake, burning, and stoning, decided at the Eighth Council of Toledo in 653. It's hard to nail down a specific time and place where things really began getting even worse for the Jewish people. Some areas like Spain really worked to push them out and cast them as subhumans not deserving his rights, while other areas saw some Jews being able to own their own property. Much of this depended on the fervency of the Christianity that had overtaken the region and whether conversion to that Christianity was mandatory or voluntary. It should also be notable that there were periods of plenty for the Jewish people, such as those who settled in the Iberian Peninsula. When the Islamic Empire spread through the region, Jews, Muslims, and Christians lived in harmony until the Reconquista in the 13th century when Christians retaked the area from the Moors. But back to Europe. In this murky several hundred year stretch from the fall of the Roman Empire to the beginning of the Crusades, we get the origins of what could be called modern anti-Semitism. Because of their faith, most merchant guilds and craftspeople weren't allowed to be Jewish people. Likewise, for a long time, Christians were forbidden from usury or charging interest on loans. So, with few ways to make money, Jewish people would often fill the hole in the market and become money lenders, bankers, and tax collectors. This gap in status between Jews and Christians was exacerbated by Jewish tradition, which often stressed education from a young age so every Jewish man could read the Torah, resulting in Jews being able to handle basic arithmetic better than the average peasantry. From We Need to Talk About Antisemitism by Rabbi Diana Fersco. Quote, Jews were forced to flee from England, Spain, Morocco, Yemen, Egypt, Iran, Iraq, France, Germany, Hungary, Lithuania, Austria, Portugal, Poland, Syria, and Algeria, to name a few. Associating Jews with money is one of the fastest ways to start an anti-Semitic conversation and to fuel Jewish negative feelings. If you say Jews are rich and you can cast Jews as controlling money, you've automatically created anger, resentment, and an easy target. Anti-Semitism often feels like punching up. Let's bring those rich Jews down, the anti-Semite thinks." End quote. And I'd ask that you really contemplate this. Today we have racist memes like the happy merchant depicting a stereotype of a Jewish person and playing into caricatures of being greedy, miserly swindlers. Yet the whole reason those stereotypes began was due to persecution. First being persecuted by the Romans, then being led into slavery and scattered throughout the Roman Empire, and then hundreds of years later being persecuted by Christian rulers under threat of death. That's the series of events that would lead to modern anti-Semitic caricatures. Then came the Crusades, where after centuries of various persecutions across Europe, Jews would find themselves defenseless against roving bands of crusading simpletons sent to claim a nebulous holy land from the clutches of what were seen as Muslim invaders. In 1095, Pope Urban II declared that if the holy land could be taken back from the Muslims, God would pardon any sins for those who had helped. You might see where this is going, as not four years later Jerusalem would be captured by crusaders. But it was 1096 where the People's Crusade took place, beginning a spree of pogroms against Jewish people. A pogrom refers specifically to an attack against Jewish populations by non-Jewish groups. They become especially prominent during the 1800s in Russia, which we will see later. See, a bunch of ill-informed peasants given free reign to do whatever they want to as means to an end, who had been indoctrinated with several hundred years of bigotry, took it upon themselves to attack Jews for their money and for being enemies of Christianity. Jewish people were hated by fervent Christians for being, quote, the ones who killed Christ, which wasn't true. Christ was crucified by Romans under Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate, for some quick background history, wasn't a Jew. In fact, historical accounts by both Jewish and Roman historians like Josephus and Tacitus, respectively, confirm that he was not very well liked by Jews for offending their traditions during his time as Roman governor. 
But even if that were true, that Pilate was in cahoots with Jewish leaders at the time, why would that cast a dim light on every Jewish person? This is an early example of depicting Jewish people as a monolith, despite a variety of opinions between different groups in Judaism. Of course, that didn't matter to the Crusaders seeking to unleash a new Christian empire on the world. They had no knowledge of history, only a cursory understanding of what their leaders wanted them to believe. Many Crusaders had gone into debt as a result of needing equipment, armor, and weaponry. Catholicism forbade usury, so many justified the pogroms as part of their holy obligations. For five months, a peasant army killed thousands of Jewish people in the Rhineland, now known as France and Germany. Estimates range from 2,000 to 12,000 depending on historical accounts. The horror of these pogroms cannot be understated. Here is a written first-hand account from Albert of Aix, who was an eyewitness to the 1096 massacre. Quote, but Emiko and the rest of his band held a council and after sunrise attacked the Jews in the hall with arrows and lances. Breaking the bolts and doors, they killed the Jews, about 700 in number, who in vain resisted the force and attack of so many thousands. They killed the women also, and with their swords pierced tender children of whatever age and sex. The Jews, seeing that their Christian enemies were attacking them and their children, and that they were sparing no age, likewise fell upon one another, brother, children, wives, and sisters, and thus they perished at each other's hands. Horrible to say, mothers cut the throats of nursing children with knives and stabbed others, preferring them to perish thus by their own hands rather than be killed by the weapons of the uncircumcised. From this cruel slaughter of the Jews, a few escaped, and a few, because of fear rather than because of love of the Christian faith, were baptized. With very great spoils taken from these people, Count Emico, Clarebold, Thomas, and all that intolerable company of men and women then continued on the way to Jerusalem." End quote. The Jewish people would find themselves frequent targets for their religious affiliation and financial standing throughout the Crusades. In 1099, a thousand years after the Jews were first driven from Jerusalem, Crusaders took the city as the Holy Land and massacred many Jews and Muslims inside. It's only natural that among a divided, disparate, and uneducated populace that after being inculcated to hate Jews, they would begin forming superstitions around them. It was no longer enough to hate Jewish people for being different or not converting or being forced into money lending and banking jobs. No, the peasantry of Europe began mythologizing the Jews, casting them as blood-drinking villains, monsters with supernatural and demonic power who fed on the unsuspecting populace. In essence, the beginning of conspiracy theories. For an example of this, look no further than the case of William of Norwich in 1144. William was a 12-year-old boy found murdered with no possible suspects and bizarre markings on his body. His uncle, a local priest, blamed the Jews, and thus a legend was born that Jews would sacrifice Christian children for blood rituals on Passover. This is especially ironic, as the Torah forbids the consumption of blood from an animal, as it is believed that the life of the animal is contained in the blood. There was no basis to these claims or proof of Jews being involved, but that didn't stop the superstitions from spreading. In France, in 1294, a child was killed and Jews were blamed and run out of the city. A hundred years or so later, 90 Jews would be arrested following the hanging death of an 18-year-old boy. Hundreds of years later, Italian Jews would be burned at the stake and tortured over a rumor that they had killed a two-year-old boy, Simon of Trent, and had used the blood to make matzah, a food prepared by Jewish people during the Passover. The story around Simon of Trent is especially galling. Jews actually joined the search and found the body of the boy, yet were all arrested and forced to admit to murdering the boy under torture. This account would spread through Italy and inspire other murders to be blamed on Jewish people. All of this again, with no proof. Throughout Europe, these superstitions would persist. They have no basis in anything but the simple fears brought on by simple minds. Yet even today, these conspiracies, referred to as blood libel or blood sacrifice, can be found in conspiracies like QAnon, which rambles about a satanic cabal of elites who drink the blood of children. These conspiracies are often intertwined with fears of Jewish control and a new world order. But much like Jewish predominance as bankers and lenders, it was something forced upon them, due to their status as outsiders in a predominantly and fervently Christian social hierarchy. As the Crusades died down, Jews in Europe continued to be ostracized. The Lateran Council of 1215 forbade Jews from holding public office, from charging exorbitant interest in loans, and mandated Jews wear different clothing to prevent intermarriage between Jews and Christians. When the Black Death or Bubonic Plague began to spread in the early 1300s, Jews were naturally blamed among other phenomena. Jews were less impacted by the plague in some areas due to washing as part of religious obligations. 
While historians now know that the plague spread due to poor living conditions, hygiene, and particularly rats and vermin, that didn't stop many countries from looking for someone else to blame their troubles on in the moment, and Jewish people who appeared to be suffering less from sickness were ripe targets. From Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers. Quote, Jewish moneylenders were routinely blamed for outbreaks of bubonic plague and lawlessness, while tens of thousands of Spanish Jews were killed in the late 1300s because of their economic success, those unwilling to convert to Christianity singled out. Ultimately, usury would be one of the justifications given for Spain's Edict of 1492, demanding either the baptism or expulsion of the kingdom's 300,000-strong Jewish population, a justification repeated with the expulsion of Spain's Moorish population in 1609. End quote. As mentioned here, Spain massacred, expelled, or forcibly converted tens of thousands of Jews from the mid-1300s to the 1400s, spurred by a series of inquisitions. In 1516, the Venetian government would force Jews to live in segregated areas, leading to the first known usage of the term ghetto, though the origins of the word itself are debated. In 1543, German monk Martin Luther, the man who started the Protestant Reformation and began Lutheranism, would write, On the Jews and their lies. This text, spurred by Luther's personal disagreements with Jews after splitting from the Catholic Church, would go on to become integral to Nazi rhetoric, and Luther was even cited by Adolf Hitler in Mein Kampf as one of history's great reformers. This is notable not just because of how Luther's rhetoric would be echoed, but because as early as 1523, Luther had shown compassion for Jews, urging Catholics to treat them better. But over the ensuing 20 years, he grew annoyed with Jews' insistence on not converting to Protestantism, and came to claim their doctrines as heretical, falling back into stereotypes about them killing Christ, and superstitions that had spread through medieval Europe. These beliefs of Luther as one of the leaders of the Reformation could be linked directly to modern anti-Semitism in churches we've covered like the NIFB, who echo many of these baseless talking points. And all of this was the standard for Jewish life across Europe for several hundred years. They were routinely blamed for social ills in small communities due to their outsider status, a status I feel obligated to remind everyone was a result of their enslavement and expulsion under the Roman Empire that had spread the Jewish diaspora throughout Europe. When they weren't being forced to live under different conditions or outside of cities and towns, Jewish people kept to themselves, understandable in a world that constantly sought to convert, kill, or blame them. And for that still, they were pushed from regular life and distrusted. After being forced from skilled trades and ostracized from more honorable professions, Jews in Europe didn't have much of a choice in what professions they chose to survive. This led to broad professions like traveling merchants, peddlers of wares, and money lending. Some of these more nomadic jobs would be preferable due to the persecution they faced, but also maintained an image of the Jewish outsider and stranger to the ignorant peasantry. And because Jews already had several superstitions surrounding them through the Middle Ages, including the false ideas about blood libel, and that Jews were even vampiric beings seen pictured here, the scant professions the Jewish people were forced into became associated with them and blended with the persecution they already faced. Jews became known as dastardly, scheming cheats and swindlers. These factors all coalesce to form what we now know as the basic arguments of modern anti-Semitism. The stereotypes of Jews as devious, conniving double-dealers, manipulators, and bloodthirsty mystics came from church leaders and short-sighted rulers otherwise forgotten by history. People looking for someone else to blame their troubles on. Yet not every area was as eager to push the Jews out, leading countries like Poland to become centers of Judaism in Europe around the 17th century. Although they were forced to the edges of the country, and more Jews lived in Russia's Pale of Settlement than in the entirety of the rest of Europe by the 1770s. The Pale of Settlement sat between Russia, Prussia, and Austria-Hungary, which would later become Germany. While there was a higher concentration of Jewish people here, there were also many waves of pogroms through the 1800s. The inciting incidents vary, such as a reported foreign agent responsible for the assassination of Tsar Alexander II possibly being Jewish, to local issues with debtors and moneylenders. After the Bolshevik Revolution of the early 1900s, pogroms would continue to target Jews, resulting in hundreds of thousands of deaths across the region driven by anti-Bolshevik sentiment that equated Jewish people with the political movement. But that's getting ahead of things. As the Industrial Revolution approached and commerce opened wider doors to new continents and between nations, the Jewish people found less restrictions on working jobs aside from those forced upon them. Like nearly every demographic during the Industrial Revolution, Jews found themselves on both the side of the exploited class and the exploiting class. 
For the next several hundred years, Europe would see a constantly revolving door of leaders, revolutions, and shifts to power and borders. And as wars shifted from being regional conflicts with peasant armies to concentrated efforts between nations, Jewish people, like many others working as captains of industries and textiles and agriculture and manufacturing, saw windfalls. This led to the rise of one of the most prominent Jewish families for conspiracy theorists to blame, the Rothschilds. I do recommend reading the book by Mike Rothschild, no relation, Jewish Space Lasers, for a full comprehensive history of the family because it is a sprawling tale of dynastic intrigue and will be fascinating for anyone interested in backroom politics and money men behind the revolutions in France and America. From the book, quote, by the 1820s, the Rothschilds dominated European finance, almost single-handedly developing what would become the international bond market. They were counselors and lenders to European royalty, the Vatican, prime ministers, and King George IV himself, and they were now bankers to the Holy Alliance, the treaty group of Russia, Prussia, and Austria that emerged to combat future French militarism. Rothschilds and their agents worked over the next few years to defuse a number of tense situations that easily could have exploded into war, by using letters as unofficial diplomatic channels, and by loaning money to cash-strapped kingdoms in return for promises of peace. One financial adventure from around this time, Nathan Rothschild saving the Bank of England from collapse in 1825, would provide yet another durable canard and conspiracy theory for cranks to distribute. But as with Waterloo, the truth is much less operatic than the conspiracy theories. When a gold price collapse put the Bank of England at risk of failing, N.M. Rothschild stepped in with a large loan. End quote. The Waterloo mentioned here is referring to a long-held conspiracy that the Rothschilds made a sizable fortune by exploiting knowledge of Napoleon's defeat at Waterloo before anyone else knew. This, unsurprisingly, is a conspiracy spread by an anti-Semitic pamphlet primarily that was published decades after the incident, and I recommend this article by The Independent for more information. The Waterloo incident is notable in particular for how the anti-Semitism spread after the incident, not concurrently with it. It only became in vogue for the people trying to frame Jewish people and the Rothschilds to use the event at a later time as retroactive proof for their anti-Semitism rather than just evidence of the Rothschilds' shrewd business practices. We will see this develop as something of a trend, where anti-Semitic proof is offered far, far later to capitalize on something that happened to Jewish people previously. Occurrences, like Waterloo, may not have been commonplace, but they allowed Jewish families like the Rothschilds to gain immense capital at the height of the Industrial Revolution, and would in turn fuel the fires of anti-Semitic conspiracies for decades to come. In 1844, Karl Marx, whose work with Friedrich Engels would lead to the philosophies of communism and socialism, published On the Jewish Question, which posited that Jews were inherently to blame for much of the ills of industry as a class of profiteers. While Marx would never explicitly denounce the blatant anti-Semitism here, he would later clarify his issues as being not so much with Jews as capitalists in general, and it should be noted that Karl Marx himself was of Jewish descent. Ironically, this criticism of Jewish-headed capitalism from the man who created Marxism wouldn't stop modern conspiracies, as claiming Marxism and communism are part of a Jewish conspiracy to undermine the West, among other far-fetched fantasies that persist today. Jewish association with communism goes way back to the Red Scare in America and the early 1900s. Much of this was, at the time, born from movements such as Bundism, a labor movement in Russia headed by Jews that was eventually absorbed into the Communist Party. Yet the facts behind Bundism don't square with communism as a plot by elites when it was primarily driven by proletariat workers, just one of the many inconsistencies we will see develop in the next century of anti-Semitism. Pamphlets spread through 1800s Europe furthered anti-Semitic conspiracies, often tied to completely unhinged theories like the Hebrew talisman, which seemed to lend the Rothschilds dark supernatural powers as an explanation for their money and influence. Many of these pamphlets, while completely spurious, would keep superstitions about Jews, among other races, alive during a time of invention and discovery, greatly contributing to the bigotry that would unfold in the 1900s. The 1800s would see a shift in the social approach to anti-Semitism. It begins to shift from a hatred based in religious practice and becomes one more based in ethnicity. Amid the Industrial Revolution driving an immigrant-based workforce and pseudoscientists developing ideas of eugenics and other inherent differences in races, Jewish people would find themselves in the targets of bigots who sought to use these social shifts to discriminate against them. In 1879, Wilhelm Marr, who would coin the term anti-Semitism, wrote The Victory of Judaism Over Germandom, prophesying that through their devious social engineering, the Jewish class would control all of Germany in 40 years. For those doing the math, that would be the 1920s, which did not involve Jewish control over everything. 
Quote, it is no ostentious prophecy, but a deeply felt conviction when I say that no more than four generations shall pass before the Jews usurp every other office of state, including the very highest. Yes, Jewry shall raise Germany to a world power and make it the new Palestine of Europe. It won't come about by violent revolution, but by a voice of the people itself. As soon as German society has reached the highest level of social bankruptcy and perplexity towards which we are rushing headlong. End quote. And here we see how long-held stereotypes about Jewish people begin to morph. Because of the success of industry captains, the Jewish people are now to blame, according to Wilhelm Marr, for social bankruptcy. In today's terms, he might call this social engineering and specifically blame Jews for teaching critical race theory or transgenderism. It's stunning to see, in such clear terms, how little has changed in over 150 years and how bigots appeal to emotions while lacking logic. These fears about Jews overtaking the country were entirely unfounded. History has proven that. Yet somehow this plea from Marr echoes modern conspiracies like white replacement, global elites undermining Western values, and others often intersecting with anti-Semitic hatred. Keep Marr's anti-Semitism in mind, because it begins a long line of pamphlets, books, and crackpot conspiracies that have long since been debunked, yet managed to proliferate in a straight line from that time to today. In 1896, Austro-Hungarian writer Theodor Herzl would publish a proposition to establish a Jewish state, a place where the Jewish people could live free of persecution. The very idea of this was spawned through a confluence of events that led to the area around Austria, Hungary, and Poland having an influx of Jewish populations from across hundreds of years, yet still saw Jews being persecuted and isolated to a certain extent, despite growing capital among Jewish families. Herzl's writing The Jewish State was the beginning of political Zionism, or the belief that the Jews deserve a nation under themselves, which Herzl said should be decided by a council of nations. It should be noted that nationalism was a hot topic at the time, and Herzl wasn't the only one who saw its strength through ethnic and national unity. Herzl was inspired by his own experiences during college, where he originally believed Jews ought to better blend into the rest of society to avoid discrimination, foregoing traditional dress and religious rituals to assimilate. This belief of Herzl's would be shifted by France's Dreyfus Affair. The Dreyfus Affair was a 1894 controversy surrounding a French military officer and descendant of a Jewish textile family, Alfred Dreyfus, who was found accused of selling military secrets. It is an example of how Jewish people, by nature of being depicted as duplicitous, are often accused of having dual loyalties. Plenty of modern anti-Semitism deals with this, accusing Jewish people in U.S. government of being secret foreign agents, and so on and so forth. However, the proceedings around the case are still called into question. As he was smeared by an anti-Semitic faction, and when evidence was brought to light that could exonerate him, it would be dismissed almost outright. Seeing the blatant anti-Semitism perpetrated in the media, along with his own experiences, led Herzl to the idea of Zionism. And while the Jewish state of Israel wouldn't be founded until after World War II, Herzl's writings lay another foundational aspect of modern anti-Semitism, that Israel has been working behind the scenes for decades to establish itself as a world power. The problem with most conspiracies around this point is that, like any group or minority, not all Jewish people agreed on everything, which kind of throws conspiracies into disarray. For example, the Rothschilds, who are still favorites of conspiracists to blame the world's ills and wars on, were not in favor of Herzl's initiative of establishing a Jewish nation. From Jewish Space Lasers by Mike Rothschild, quote, Austro-Hungarian writer Theodor Herzl made his initial proposal for a Judenstadt, a Jewish state, to the Rothschilds, even originally subtitling his 1896 pamphlet of the same name addressed to the Rothschilds. Herzl believed that only the Rothschilds could supply the billion marks needed to repatriate Europe's harried Jews to either Argentina or Palestine, where they could establish their own nation. But Natty and Leopold in London, along with Baron Albert von Rothschild in Vienna, all rejected Herzl's Proposal, seeing his interest as a Zionist form of socialism as a threat to their own financial interests and attempt to found settlements in Palestine. Moreover, they didn't support the idea of a Jewish state in general. End quote. And, as I mentioned in the beginning, there are still huge debates being had today between Jews on the values of nationalism, of having a Jewish state, or integrating into larger society. In 1903, we see the first publication of the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion, perhaps the most influential and well-known anti-Semitic piece of propaganda of all time. While the Protocols are often cited by conspiracists as the documentation of a secret meeting of Jewry, here being a term used by anti-Semites, it has long since been revealed as a forgery. A forgery with a fascinating past, starting in 1864, when a French satirist, Maurice Jolie, wrote 
Dialogues in Hell Between Machiavelli and Montesquieu, a satirical pamphlet aimed at Napoleon III that ended up putting the author in prison. In 1868, a German postal clerk, Hermann Goetsch, adapted Jolly's work into a series of novels that includes depictions of a centennial midnight cemetery meeting of Jewish rabbis plotting to control the world. In 1872, a copy of his story, entitled The Jewish Cemetery in Prague, would be published as a non-fiction pamphlet. Marking the story's transition from obvious fiction to a story that no matter how unbelievable would be seen as true. Eventually, Russian secret police would alter and combine the works of Goch and Jolie, publishing the new amalgamation as the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. It is widely believed to have been a forgery commissioned by the Russian secret police, the Okhrana, in the 1890s when the Okhrana were hiding in Paris during the Dreyfus Affair. The Protocols would be brought to Russia in 1895 and publicly published for the first time in 1905. In the late 1800s, Jews occupied a precarious position in Russian politics, seen as aligning with the liberal reform parties, which were in contention with Russia's more militaristic arms like the Okhrana. As a result, when tensions boiled over amid the region's revolutionary climate, Jews would be repeatedly targeted. This would result in several pogroms from 1903 and 1905 that ended with the deaths of thousands of Russian Jews. The Kishinev pogrom in particular would see the deaths of 49 and destruction of more than 1,500 Jewish homes and would be a major factor in many fleeing to the US and what was then Palestine. So what caused these waves of mass targeted death? Historians can only speculate as there's no mentions of Jewish murders or conspiracies or any other inciting incidents. Some historians think the Jews served as a scapegoat, as outsiders, a group to blame for a fracturing political climate, and others see the violence as an extension of ultra-conservative and reactionary religion that villainized Jews similarly to the Church of the Middle Ages. From here, the protocols of the Elders of Zion would be spread along with waves of violence aimed at Jewish communities. After the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, the protocols were spread as fact, used to justify more mass slaughter by the reactionary white armies. Soon after, the Russian copies of the protocols would be brought to Europe and retranslated back to English, French, German, and more, cementing the legacy of a forgery used to incite political violence. What began decades earlier as satire and fiction would be regarded as fact by those with similar goals to the Russian police and white armies to depict Jews as responsible for the ills of society, to incite violence against them, and to distract from the political goals of those shouting loudest that the Jews were responsible for everything wrong with society. 1921 would be the first time the protocols were proven as a forgery, but that wouldn't stop the beliefs within from spreading, aided by developments like Henry Ford's International Jew. The International Jew was a series of tomes published across 91 issues and distributed across the country that spread mass anti-Semitism, blaming Jews for most political developments, agricultural failings, and anything else that was found newsworthy. The protocols would be further spread as the International Jew was translated into 16 languages for worldwide distribution. During this time, Ford would republish the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, spreading the conspiracy, which had already been proven as a forgery, to an audience upwards of half a million people from denying the Holocaust. Quote, the protocols were often cited as evidence of a Jewish conspiracy. An article in the Chicago Tribune contended that communism was intimately linked to the Jewish conspiracy to dominate the world. On the same day that this article appeared, the Christian Science Monitor's lead editorial, titled The Jewish Peril, argued that the protocols bore a striking similarity to the conspiracy of the Order of the Illuminati. Conspiracy theorists had long identified the Illuminati as Lucifer's modern successors. They supposedly used reason to undermine religion and the political order and establish world government. Not only were they said to be the force behind the French Revolution, but they were also held responsible for Karl Marx's Communist Manifesto and facilitated the rise of communism. According to this nexus of conspiratorial delusions, which the Dearborn Independent repeated Jews and Jewish bankers in particular were responsible for the Illuminati's nefarious deeds. Those who unearthed this conspiracy were able to impose a logical coherence on the seemingly irrational nature of their charges, bankers aiding communists, by arguing that the bankers anticipated that the communists would create a world government that they would then appropriate and control." End quote. But these developments in anti-Semitism reflected the anxieties of the time. After decades of immigration and workforce development as major cities industrialized, the outsider was becoming a major part in American society like never before. And reactionary groups used fears of invasion and preserving civilized society or even just the white race to bolster support for their politics. 
Among Protestant whites in America in particular, this period of social division would lead to the resurgence of the KKK and membership of the bedsheet wearing wizards would soar into the millions. While the protocol spread from forgery to accepted conspiracist truth, World War I shocked Europe from 1914 to 1918 laying the groundwork for the greatest concentrated effort of violence against the Jewish people during World War II. While conspiracy theorists persist that the Rothschilds essentially controlled World War I, this isn't true. From Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers, quote, Far from their almost single-handedly funding of the effort against Napoleon or of Prussia and the Franco-Prussian War, the Rothschilds lent virtually nothing to support the enormous war effort. Instead, in 1914, the French Rothschilds had to look outside of the family for help, going to their American rival J.P. Morgan & Co. to establish a line of credit for France. It would be Morgan that served as the purchasing agents and principal lenders to Great Britain and France in the time leading up to the United States' entry in the war in 1917. It was a syndicate of banks led by Morgan that made the massive Anglo-French loan of 1915, a $500 million boost to the Allied war effort. And it was firms like Morgan that were accused of steering the United States into the war in order to maximize their own profits. Though American entry into the war was likely inevitable. Other than early connections between the French house and Morgan, the Rothschilds played no role in any of these transactions." End quote. Yet these developments wouldn't stop post-war conspiracies spreading, particularly in Germany that Jews had intentionally undermined the country's war effort, profiteering from both sides in conspiracies that ignored facts in favor of old tropes with no proof. It should also be noted that an estimated 100,000 German Jews fought for Germany in World War I, many of whom would receive the Iron Cross, Germany's military equivalent of the Medal of Honor. All in all, doesn't seem like much of an effective way to undermine a war effort? This development would play a massive role in German anti-Semitism moving forward, and is just one of the myriad ways Jewish people have managed to rise from struggle, fall, yet still be scapegoated as a group of internal puppet masters. In 1926, Arthur Chirop Spiridovich, a former member of the White Army, published The Secret World Government, which would further conspiracies about secretive cabals playing both sides of global conflict to manipulate society. An avowed anti-Semite, it shouldn't be surprising he was inspired by the protocols. Chirop Spiridovich was widely regarded as a conspiracy crank who made claims he could never prove or back up, like foretelling World War I or saving royals from assassinations. Despite these grand, maybe fake accomplishments, and even getting the approval of fellow anti-Semite Henry Ford, he would die penniless of an apparent suicide. Hey everyone, I am splicing this in during editing, but I want to put a big content warning here. During the editing process, I've had to make a lot of choices about how graphic I want to be with the history presented. Much of this history has been ugly. For this reason, I haven't included any of the documented medical experimentation from the Holocaust. I feel it would serve no purpose aside from shock value. However, during my research, I came across footage of allies liberating concentration camps. It is harrowing documentations of horrors most people can't fathom. I won't show what I consider to be the worst of it, which includes film of bulldozers shifting piles of bodies into ditches and massive fields of the dead, which include the beaten and desecrated. Of all the things I researched for this video, going through this footage has been the most emotionally disturbing. I want to give this preface because I am going to show footage from these camps that do include dead bodies. I don't do this for shock value, though it is shocking. I do it because I feel it's important to see even a fraction of the cruelty to understand it. Especially given this conversation leads directly into discussions about Holocaust denial, and I feel this irrefutable proof, while hard to stomach, is a necessary piece of history to witness, not just to understand the magnitude of such inhumanity, but to better counter and understand Holocaust denialists who might claim it didn't happen. I feel the Holocaust has been overlooked for many, and with the staggering lack of knowledge about it in modern American schooling, I feel a responsibility to share this footage to help educate. For any Jewish viewers or those who will be otherwise sensitive to this content, I advise you to skip ahead. I have cut around footage to not feature the most grotesque, images, but I wanted to take a moment and give this warning because I personally feel most people should be prepared before seeing what comes next. With that said, content warnings apply here for photos of dead bodies, mass graves, starvation, torture, and images depicting mass crimes against humanity. Like the undercurrent of anti-Semitism, Hitler's rise to power had a basis in several socioeconomic issues that had pervaded Germany and Europe for generations. Hitler's blaming of issues on the Jews was really the same bigotry that had been brewing for hundreds of years, just pushed by a meth head with fanatical military power and an after-school club. 
Hitler would also be unsurprisingly influenced by the anti-Semitic writings of Martin Luther, the Protocols, and was an admirer of Henry Ford. It's easy to look back on history and think, well, America fought the Nazis. There couldn't have been anyone in the States that thought this Hitler gent was an upstanding fellow. The problem is, there absolutely was. America in the 1930s and 40s was far from a bastion of equality. After the Japanese army raids on Pearl Harbor, Eisenhower, for example, put Japanese Americans into forced internment camps. Additionally, there were a plethora of anti-interventionalist politicians and academics, many whom followed the America First movement when it founded in 1940. They advocated against helping Britain in World War II against Germany while extolling nationalist and racist values. The group was originally led by Henry Ford before Charles Lindbergh, who had been able to visit Germany and see their Luftwaffe in 1937, took over. Lindbergh would say shit like the United States need to be ready to, quote, defend the white race against foreign invasion. Father Charles C. Coughlin would be one of the first major political voices in radio, at one time amassing a estimated audience of 30 million. He also openly supported German and Italian fascist doctrine in the 1930s and spread fears of Jewish bankers controlling the government. He also spread communist conspiracies. From the New York Times write-up of his death in 1979, quote, The most dangerous communist, he said in one broadcast, is the wolf in sheep's clothing of conservatism, who bent upon preserving the policies of greed. The wolves, he explained, included Herbert Hoover, the Morgans, quote, every money changer in Wall Street. These conspiracies would be regurgitated by Congressman John E. Rankin in 1941, who accused Jews of working with Wall Street to orchestrate a war. If that sounds familiar, he also accused Jews of using Hollywood to orchestrate subversion of American values in media and proclaimed white people were being persecuted. Unbelievable how none of this shit turned out to be true, and we're still hearing it almost 100 years later. Great. While America First as a movement wasn't strictly ethno-nationalist, its advocation for anti-Semitism brought in fringe support for Nazi supporters in America, which, if you've been keeping track, should feel eerily familiar to modern conservative and nationalist movements that might not specifically be about racism, but sure do have a lot of Nazis hanging in the background. Society was still segregated between colors of skin and would continue to be for another 20 to 30 years until the civil rights movement of the 1960s. By 1913, 23 states had laws against race mixing marriages because children had been deemed genetically inferior from mixed race couples. Additionally, the KKK had a boom in membership across the 1920s, which actually led to the founding of the ADL or Anti-Defamation League after the KKK led lynching of Leo Frank in Atlanta. Leo Frank was likely wrongfully accused of raping and murdering a 13-year-old girl, echoing now age-old blood libel fears. It's hard to say how wrongfully accused he was because the case was so poorly handled. The ADL is a Jewish organization still scapegoated today, by the way. Most recently, the ADL has condemned Elon Musk for retweeting and seemingly supporting white supremacist talking points. It should be noted that the ADL has also conflated Judaism with Zionism, which isn't great, but we will talk about towards the end. It's this kind of history that people complain about when they say we shouldn't teach kids critical race theory, by the way, because then kids might know that America isn't a meritocracy and has a bad history of racism. Now, because apparently way too many people graduate from high school in America not even knowing what the Holocaust was, we're going to talk about it. This will probably get my video limited ads, but screw it. This is important because so much of modern anti-Semitism hinges on the idea that the Holocaust never happened. The Holocaust is the term for the systematic extermination of Jews across Poland, Germany, and other areas seized during the rise of the Third Reich. It is also referred to by the Hebrew word Shoah. It started after Hitler's rise to chancellorship when the Nazi party began passing a variety of laws, targeting the freedoms of Jewish people and other undesirables like Romani people, gays, and other people they viewed falsely as inherently inferior. Soon, Germany was rounding up Jews and housing them in squalor in neighborhoods known as ghettos, and from there it escalated to work camps that would see families torn apart. Men, women, and children starved, beaten, raped, and worked to death. Additionally, Jews were used for quote-unquote medical experiments, which here is a fancy term for torture. I won't go into it here because during my research, I decided descriptions of the treatment alone without any images are too grotesque to describe even in a purely clinical context. It should be noted that Germany wasn't the only ultranationalist country obsessed with superiority and heritage that employed these tactics. While it's often overshadowed by the sheer magnitude of the Holocaust, Japan's imperial army perpetrated unspeakable crimes against humanity, often resorting to similar justification under the guise of medical experimentation. The worst offenders were Unit 731, 
which killed an estimated 200,000 to 300,000 civilians. Upon the end of World War II, all living test subjects were killed. And if you're wondering what happened to the scientists and their findings, the United States would buy them out and use the research for our own biological weapons department. This would echo the United States' acceptance of Nazi scientists and engineers after World War II, who were granted clemency for their research into rocket and weapons development, which would go directly into the United States' efforts to launch rockets into space. Look up Operation Paperclip for more info on that. Despite what denialists may say, the Holocaust wasn't a matter of debate. In 1923, Adolf Hitler would try to overtake control of the Weimar Republic. Hitler's growing Nazi party had been spreading for years, blaming Jews for Germany's post-war woes and national disgrace. His coup, now known as the Beer Hall Pooch, would be a failure, but Hitler's time in prison allowed him to write Mein Kampf or My Struggle, in which he echoed age-old anti-Semitic conspiracies like those in the Protocols, and labeled Jews and communism as the two greatest threats to mankind. Hitler wrote that the Protocols were an authentic document, by the way, attesting to the forgery's influence and spread by that point. In Mein Kampf, Hitler played on eugenics arguments to portray Jews and Bolsheviks as genetically inferior subhumans who pollute society by way of spreading their degeneracy, an argument still used by the far right today, though the perpetrators range from Jews to quote-unquote cultural Marxists. But it's still the same conspiracy drivel. Hitler would rise to power as chancellor in 1933. The global stock market crash and ensuing depression would create the perfect conditions for the rise of Nazism, as Hitler specifically promised prosperity and the return of German industry to the civilians of Germany. Three months after Hitler's chancellorship, the SS would establish Dachau, which would become one of the most infamous extermination camps in the Holocaust. Dachau was a forced work camp that set the template for Germany's camps moving forward. Of the 200,000 people sent there, an estimated 40,000 would perish. Next came several waves of anti-Jewish sentiment. Throughout Germany, Jewish businesses were boycotted, schools were segregated, only Aryans were allowed to work as journalists to control the spread of information, and Jews were removed from government positions. The Nuremberg Laws of 1935 would legally establish racial differences between Germans and Jews, taking away Jewish citizenship and banning mixed-race marriage. Nazi sympathizers nowadays try to paint Hitler's approach and motivations as an effort to simply push Jews out rather than genocide, but from the earliest efforts, that is obviously not the case. From Deborah Lipstadt's Denying the Holocaust, quote, The emigration myth, the idea that the Nazis stuck to their original aim of getting rid of Jews by emigration, is easily refuted by Nazi documents, newspapers, and journals themselves, which are replete with statements by high-ranking officials and party leaders attesting to their ultimate objective. The Nazi leader, Dr. Robert Lee, articulated these intentions in 1942 when he said that it was not enough to, quote, isolate the Jewish enemy of mankind, the Jews have got to be exterminated, end quote. In his testimony at Nuremberg, Victor Brack, who was in charge of the gassings of 50,000 mentally deficient and chronically ill Germans and Jews under the euthanasia pogrom from 1939 to 1941, acknowledged that by March 1941, it was no secret among higher party circles that the Jews were to be exterminated. In a May 1943 article in the Berlin Weekly Das Reich, Goebbels announced, No prophetic utterance by the Führer is being fulfilled with so gaunt an assurance and inescapable force as that another world war would cause the extinction of the Jewish race. End quote. In 1933, Nazis, spurred by Hitler's promise to rid Germany of any lives not worth living and degenerates, and having begun euthanasia for disabled people, then came for the Hirschfeld Institute, one of the first medical centers dedicated to the study of queer and transgender people. Run by a Jewish doctor, the institute was a library of discovery and medical advancement that had overseen the first known male-to-female surgeries, and while the findings were no doubt outdated by modern standards, the knowledge lost in the Nazi purges would set medical advancements and studies for trans and queer people back decades. More than 20,000 books were burned, containing irreplaceable medical findings as the Nazis claimed the Institute to be, quote, intellectual garbage of the past. Over the next few years, Hitler would continue persecuting Germany's minority groups unchecked, becoming president of Germany in 1934. By 1936, camps for Roma and Sinti people were established, and more concentration camps were created. Jews were fully segregated, and laws had been passed to prevent any more race mixing. Propaganda was the bread and butter of Nazi supremacy. Hitler and his chief media man Goebbels worked overtime to make as many films, books, pamphlets, radio shows, and anything else they could to depict Jewish people and outsiders as evil, and Germans as heroic. And it worked. 
When it came time for the Nazi party's violent sentiments to boil over into outright violence, many stood by and simply watched their neighbors be killed, their homes ransacked, and their families taken away. While Jewish persecution had been going on unchecked for years, most historians call it Kristallnacht, or the Night of the Broken Glass, as the true beginning of the Holocaust is a concentrated effort to not just push Jews from German society, but exterminate them. Nazi police led a series of pogroms that would reportedly claim 90 lives, though hundreds of deaths were likely. Kristallnacht was reported on the world stage, and would be one of the first times the world at large saw Hitler's open violence against the Jewish people. In 1938, Hitler would claim that an outbreak of war would, quote, end worldwide Jewry, and in 1939, Hitler would openly invade Poland, marking the beginning of World War II as the Third Reich sought to expand to Britain, Russia, France, the Middle East, and Africa in the name of Aryan superiority and the Third Reich. Remember that Poland had long since been a safe haven for Jews, and so Hitler's invasion meant more persecution. Ghettos were constructed, locking Jews by the tens of thousands into slums. Businesses were ransacked, people were killed by police in the streets. Over a million Jews, men, women, and children were shot dead by the Nazis and their collaborators in a wave of mass executions that started in June 1941. And finally, Jews were sent to camps like Buchenwald, Dachau, Auschwitz-B, and others. In 1941, Kelmno, a camp in Poland, would become the first camp to use gas to kill the Jews inside. Jews would be led inside under the guise of a chemical cleaning process, only to be killed with lethal doses of carbon monoxide. The bodies were then dumped by SS troops in nearby mass graves. After several months, the magnitude of the bodies began permeating the nearby areas with the smell of death, which led SS leadership to enlist camp Jews to transport the bodies to mass ovens to be incinerated. The Jewish people enlisted by camp authorities to aid in camp maintenance would be called Sonderkommando, or special units. After the war, several Sonderkommandos would give their first-hand testimony of their experiences. While not every camp was the same, this extermination had been the end goal of Hitler's rise to power for anyone paying attention. The blind vilification of a minority used to rise to power just as those small town priests and regional kings hundreds of years before, except on a scale here never previously seen. The breadth and depravity of the Holocaust strains understanding. It's so hard to imagine how millions of people across Poland, France, and Germany could be exterminated across several years. And when viewed across the whole of Jewish history in Europe, a history forced upon them by their expulsion from Jerusalem over a thousand years prior, it becomes clear that Jews didn't do anything to deserve the target placed on them. For almost every pogrom, persecution, inquisition, or holocaust, Jews as a people were only ever guilty of being the closest scapegoat to someone who could use their persecution for gain. They were a convenient and easy villain for more complicated problems. Philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre said it best, if the Jew did not exist, the anti-Semite would have made him. The Holocaust is hard to imagine. Suffering on such an unyielding magnitude, yet we know it happened. Not just because of the survivors of the camps, but because of a wealth of information from the Nazis who ran the camps, including documentation attesting to the dead bodies and the executions. In the final phases and years of the war, the Third Reich enacted the final solution, which was to begin systematically killing people in the camps. As Hitler's desperate bid for world domination suffocated his ambitions against the combined might of Europe's armies and American intervention, the SS began liquidating the prisoners even in camps not originally intended for extermination. Many of these atrocities and crimes against humanity weren't discovered until the camps were swept or liberated by Russian and American forces. And here's where it gets into some murky territory, because as the war ended, treaties were being signed, land being divided, and so many other seismic socio-political developments unfolding that would go on to define the next century, some of the coverage of these extermination camps like Dachau was messy. It relied on a mix of first-hand accounts from troops, second-hand accounts from foreign troops and reporters, and a bit of hearsay. And these conditions would allow for doubt. Denialists would say, how do we know the Holocaust happened? I mean, aside from the massive amounts of historical data dedicated to it, the historians who have dedicated their lives to charting out the paths of those who lived and died in the events, and the photographic and video evidence of the emaciated dead, if you're willing to put all that aside, you might be one of the white nationalists who says the Holocaust was fake. Or, like Nick Fuentes, try to couch your anti-Semitism by saying you're just asking questions, and you just don't think it happened like historians say. The problem with combating conspiracies like Holocaust denial is that you're arguing against a stance that's not rooted in any tangible evidence. 
like occult or even other conspiracies like QAnon, some people fall so far down the rabbit hole that almost nothing will convince them of being wrong. Especially when dealing with a conspiracy like the Holocaust never happening, because conspiracists can just keep moving the goalposts. If you say, here's written, photographic, and video evidence of hundreds of thousands dying, they'll say, yes, but who wrote the history books? Who made the videos? So, let's talk about Holocaust denialism. We will get into more specific details about the conspiracies that are still pushed in coming decades, but for now I want to talk about the proof of the Holocaust that disproves denial on its face. Rabbi Diana Fersco put it best in her book, We Need to Talk About Anti-Semitism. Quote, the expansive, exacting execution of the Holocaust required infrastructure. It required monetary commitments and administrative documents. The Nazis wrote it down. They kept track. The perpetrators themselves admitted their guilt publicly time and time again. And of course, survivors have also testified at great length about their experiences, providing thousands of hours of film testimony, allowing photographers to document their tattooed arms. Germany has gone to lengths to atone for the genocide. Scholars, curators, journalists, and filmmakers, survivors, perpetrators, eyewitnesses, the governments of multiple countries, the list of people who have provided evidence of the Holocaust is vast. So to outright deny the Holocaust is to deny reality." End quote. At the risk of sounding like a conspiracy theorist, I recommend you go and do your own research. But instead of that meaning I'll point you towards a series of half-truth books that are meant to indoctrinate you into bigoted beliefs, I actually mean go and do your own research. Like any conspiracy, there's no way to truly prove Holocaust denial false because the premise itself is fantastical and detached from tangible reality. While denialists might say, see, you can't prove something didn't happen, facts aren't based on what you can't prove, but what you can. It's not unlike a cult mentality or any other conspiracy theory where evidence disproving it can always be backed up by withdrawing to another vantage point. If you provide proof of the bodies, burned or buried, they will say the evidence is tampered with or has been authored by Jewish sources. It's the twisted beauty of conspiracies like world control. There's always going to be a reason that proves you right, because in something so vast, there's always going to be someone else you can point to and blame. And so it is with Holocaust denial and in turn conspiracies about Jewish control of the world, global banking elites, and so on. But let's dispel some of the biggest myths anyway. Like I said, please go and do your own research. I will supply links below to all of my sources, and much of this information is easy to find through Google or just Wikipedia. I'm not saying you should only use Wikipedia, by the way, for all academics freaking out in the comments. I'm saying you should check out those nifty links and sources at the bottom of Wikipedia pages. They take you to some pretty cool places. But for now, let's go over what some anti-Semites say are reasons to deny the Holocaust, namely showers and ovens. Many Holocaust denialists first resort to claiming that an agent used to kill Jews, Cyclone B, was in fact used for cleaning and delousing, and that there wouldn't have been enough to kill people in the doses Nazis used. This isn't true and becomes the subject of the Lukter report, which I will get to later. Furthermore, many claim that there were no gas chambers. If you look into the various sources for these claims, some will come from various places like SS officers themselves who are surely dependable and have no reason to lie about the Jews. These claims, however, contradict those of other SS officers, Jews who were made to load the bodies, eyewitnesses, journalists who saw the camps, and more. Again, we see conspiracists believing a conspiracy being more likely than something provably true. Philip Mueller was an SS Sonder commander who survived in Auschwitz for three years and witnessed the SS develop and enact methods to kill Jews living there, which he documented in his 1979 book, Eyewitness Auschwitz, which I highly recommend. And speaking of ovens, Nazis would employ large crematoriums for body disposal in camps like Auschwitz after the piles of bodies proved unsanitary. Deniers, however, would like to say that this was physically impossible. They tried to turn it into a math problem, running estimates on how many people could fit in the buildings. When properly investigated, these findings are often easily proven false. I'll talk about the findings of former Holocaust denier Jean-Claude Prusak, who spent years studying the gas chambers in an effort to prove the Holocaust false, but came away finding the exact opposite. Furthermore, there is extensive evidence of the Nazis working with outside contractors to facilitate these crematoriums. In fact, I recommend this intensive Time article on Topfen Sons, who helped make the crematoriums used by Nazis at Auschwitz. Diving into topics like the falsity of the Luchter Report, the findings of Zon Prasak, Nazi crematoriums, and more fill in the blanks used by denialists to spread conspiracy. Yet these conspiracies continue to spread, regardless of proven facts or historical account. From Denying the Holocaust by Deborah Lipstadt. Quote, the attempt to deny the Holocaust enlists a basic strategy of distortion. Truth is mixed with absolute lies, confusing readers who are unfamiliar with the tactics of the deniers. 
half-truths and story segments, which conveniently avoid critical information, leave the listener with a distorted impression of what really happened. The abundance of documents and testimonies that confirm the Holocaust are dismissed as contrived, coerced, or forgeries and falsehoods." End quote. We have evidence of the Holocaust. What's more, we have evidence of the Nazis attempting to cover it up. We have evidence from the camps that were liberated, and eyewitness reports from Russian and American allied troops. And nearly every major piece of evidence from Holocaust deniers has been proven by time as unreliable compared to the overwhelming presence of Holocaust documentation. Many of these arguments would be proven false during the Eichmann trial of 1961, where Adolf Eichmann was found hiding in Argentina and evidence of his role in Nazi extermination was presented as legal record. Eichmann was responsible for organizing the final solution and transport of Jewish people from all over Europe to the last concentration camps at the end of World War II. His testimony is legal record, a direct account of the Nazi Reich's efforts to eliminate Jewish people and others deemed undesirable from someone in charge of it. But by the time of Eichmann's trial, conspiracies had already spread that it was all fake. Granted, these are just a few of the more common arguments I've seen in conspiracist and white nationalist circles. There is no end to the ways they will worm around logic to prove their points right, which is what makes conspiracy about Jews controlling the world and all media and all information so exciting for them. No matter what evidence to the contrary they're supplied with, no matter how grounded and vetted, it won't be enough to distract them from simple bigotry. Anyway, with all that out of the way, let's get on to the next few decades where we would see conspiracies like this fester and spread through a network of white nationalists and cranks. In 1917, Britain had promised to allocate territory to an independent Jewish state in the Middle East in the Balfour Declaration. In 1948, the state of Israel would be officially recognized by several Western countries, and several hundred thousand Jews displaced by World War II and turned away from neighboring countries would relocate to the region. This relocation would begin a series of conflicts between Israel and the surrounding countries, something still obviously contentious today. Don't worry, I will still be talking about Palestine in a bit. Almost immediately after the end of World War II, the anti-interventionalist sects that had already exhibited anti-Semitic leanings and sympathies to Germany's ruler began the work of attempting to excuse Germany's various atrocities. They would say that Allied war crimes had been worse equivocating the Holocaust with the bombings of Dresden or the nuclear bombs used by the United States against Japan. This is by no means dismissing the American war crimes here, yet it remains a false equivalency. If the previous hundred years could draw a direct line from anti-Semitic conspiracies about Jews drinking blood to propaganda like the Protocols, the decades after World War II were a spider web that linked the results of propaganda efforts like the Protocols of the Elders of Zion to nearly every modern conspiracy we know today. Through a series of cranks and profiteers, Holocaust denial, Jewish worldwide conspiracy, and racist sentiment would form an undercurrent of conspiratorial thinking across America that can be directly linked to modern far-right voices like Alex Jones, Nick Fuentes, Mark Dice, and plenty more. Interestingly, while there were attempts to shift blame, it would take several years until someone with any degree of clout outright denied the Holocaust. The degree of overwhelming evidence of the Nazis' exterminationism seemed to preclude any objection, but as the Nuremberg trials, held in Germany from 1945 to 1949, drew sympathizers for Nazi ideology, those sympathizers began speculating how the Jews were in fact behind this, and this was all a great lie. This is important to note. While denialists like to cover their arguments in epithets of free speech and just asking questions, and pretend to play at being serious scientists or historians, almost every major originator of Holocaust denialism can be linked directly back to Nazism and bigotry. They like asking questions, but not hearing the real answers. They're just asking questions so they can tell their audience their own answers. There is no basis of Holocaust denial as a study because of the massive and overwhelming body of evidence disproving their claims. In turn, Holocaust deniers must appeal to the like-minded to find their audience, casting Jewish people as great controllers and puppet masters who have simply scapegoated Hitler and organized the Holocaust to gain a foothold on the world stage. So let's talk about this long train of conspiracists that link directly to modern voices. And as we do, think about how many parallels you hear between the Jewish conspiracies of the past and the fear-mongering of modern conspiracists. In the late 1940s, fascist sympathizing poet Ezra Pound would communicate with Eustace Mullins while Pound was held for treason. Mullins, who worked at a contemporary institute for the arts in Washington, D.C., was an admirer of Hitler who, inspired by Pound, would go on to write The Secrets of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve had been established in 1913, but it was only here where a Hitler-loving conspiracist would begin the conspiracy that the Jewish people were behind it all, something still parroted today. 
Like previous conspiracy texts, Secrets of the Federal Reserve ties together a loose assemblage of half-truths and unqualified observations to deduce a Jewish plot to control society. But unlike the Protocols or other texts, this wasn't about Jews controlling through religion or controlling through war, but a Jewish plan to control the Federal Reserve and therefore control the populace through debt, lending, and inflation. Mullins would later commiserate with Alex Jones, who praised him as the grandfather of the fight against the NWO. I am extremely honored to be joined by Eustace Mullins. Eustace has written the definitive works, uh, really the great-grandfather of much of the modern movement against the Federal Reserve and the New World Order. He is literally a, 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 a living founding father in the Second American Revolution. He, of course, was the protege uh, and uh, the, uh, and I could call him, I guess, an adherent to Ezra Pound, what was he, the Nobel Prize winning uh, author, poet, who was imprisoned, imprisoned uh, for being against the World War II. And uh, Ezra Pound, ladies and gentlemen, and of course he was an expert on the New World Order and what was happening. He thought that the only thing they did was start wars and create famines and revolutions and monetary panics. But he found that it was much more sinister than that. It was a really satanic operation. Well, that's what I've found. Every time I turn over a rock, it, it, it really is satanic. Why don't you describe what you discovered? Well, what I discovered was that the most famous names in this country, the biggest and most important and influential people, like J.P. Morgan, who always had a man in the White House uh, talking to the president, and uh, these people were running the country, and they were running the world. In 1968, he would author a tract called The Biological Jew, which credited the decline of culture and society to Jewish conspiracy. In the 1950s, Christian nationalist preacher Gerald L. K. Smith would spread hate about Jewish people and other minorities. He ran for office on the organized Christian nationalist platform, calling for the expulsion of minorities from the United States. He was heavily inspired by Henry Ford's The International Jew, and even wrote a book bearing the same title. In 1959, a Christian nationalist magazine, The Cross and the Flag, would begin circulating the idea that six million Jews didn't die during the Holocaust. Also in 1959, George Lincoln Rockwell would officially form the American Nazi Party. Rockwell is the closest historical analog I can find to Nick Fuentes, ill-advised mustache and all. He was a loudmouth who simply used his platform to bully and gain financial support from a dedicated legion of likewise lonely and sad people. Rockwell was an aspirational figure for David Duke, who, like Fuentes, was a high schooler when he decided his political beliefs, which, if we know anything, is the best time to make up your mind about something and never change it. Taking a brief break from anti-Semites, in 1968, Arthur Monroe would write While Six Million Died, a book that relied on State Department testimony and Monroe's own journalistic background and determined that the United States had foreknowledge and early ability to stop Hitler's extermination of the Jews, but through either ineptitude or simply bigotry of those in charge, had failed to do so. Interestingly, while Monroe's findings should have been ripe for conspiracists to pounce on, few did. For example, if I were more conspiratorial, I'd say the U.S. was secretly in league with the Nazis, given how many captains of industry supported them, and how Nazi scientists were scouted after the war. I'm not saying that was true, but Monroe's work, opposed to the anti-Semites during this time, lays bare how easily conspiracists latch on to predetermined bigotries, rather than real-life intrigues. In 1969, David L. Hogan would publish The Myth of Six Million, not to be confused with While Six Million Died by Arthur Monroe. The book was one of the first outright accounts of Holocaust denialism, and was published by Noontide Press, which was run by Willis Cardo. Hogan would later head the Institute for Historical Review, which Cardo had co-founded. We will talk more about Willis Cardo soon. In 1970, W. Cleon Skousen would write The Naked Capitalist, which asserted that merchant bankers were behind the rise of communism across the world. This aligns with the same sentiments spread by Nazis, but were also parroted by politicians in the 1930s and 40s, Skousen was a prominent organizer of anti-communist sentiment during the McCarthy and Red Scare eras and often spread fears of infiltration by communist agents. Here we see the proliferation of fears about Jewish communism alive and well, in addition to the morphing of terms like bankers from outright anti-Semitism to a coded word that is still used today. Cleon Skousen was a real piece of work. He wanted to repeal anti-discrimination laws. He repeatedly blamed political developments on the Rockefellers or the Rothschilds. While a 1962 FBI memo had stated he was supporting far-right anti-communism efforts for, 
quote, financial gain, he would eventually join the conservative think tank, the Council for National Policy during the Reagan administration. Interestingly enough, Skousen also has several declassified FBI files on him currently available after he spent some time apparently touring the country, giving lectures and speaking at colleges and schools, uh, proclaiming to be a former special agent and expert in communism. The FBI didn't really think so and continued to question why he felt so compelled to speak on communism when he had no background or experience working with it. Skousen wasn't ever an avowed anti-Semite in the same ways as some of the others mentioned here, but his rhetoric laid some groundwork for others to seep into. In 1971, we would get another seminal tome of the conspiracist movement in None Dare Call It Conspiracy by Gary Allen. From Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers, quote, None Dare combines Mullen's Federal Reserve attacks with Skousen's Council on Foreign Relations paranoia. It even specifically cites Carol Quigley, just as Skousen had, and, like Skousen, Quigley was not a fan of the interpretation, making relentless attacks on the non-existent Rockefeller-Rothschild alliance to rule the world. To None Dare, they were charter members of the Insiders, using illegal income tax to suck up the wealth of ordinary working men at the point of a gun and funnel it into international bankers who hold the United States' crippling national debt. None dare call it conspiracy, while changing explicit anti-Semitism to words like insiders, much as Skousen has used bankers to describe the elite classes scheming for world control, builds on anti-Semitic texts that came before. It casts Jewish families as responsible for pushing communism and socialism, and simply regurgitates the same fears from the protocols and Hitler's writings about a shadowy cabal working behind the scenes to rob the common man, though changes the name of the true group responsible slightly. Meanwhile, back in Holocaust denial, Austin J. App was an anti-Semite and anti-interventionalist professor who developed his theories over several years, culminating in his 1973 pamphlet, The Six Million Swindle, blackmailing the Germanic people for hard marks with fabricated corpses. In the pamphlet, he asserted that no Jews were killed in gas chambers, there was no proof of the six million dead, and Talmudists and Bolsheviks were to blame for perpetrating this conspiracy, among other lies. The pamphlet, despite becoming quite influential, was only about 26 pages long, and includes such Factual assertions as New York becoming a new Sodom and Gomorrah because black people find employment there. Oh, his primary sources were testimonies of Nazis during war crime trials, and nearly every assertion he's made has been proven false, despite his sources being repeated by modern denialists. In 1974, a neo-Nazi would publish the pamphlet, Did Six Million Really Die?, which is really only notable because it would lead to a lawsuit in 1983, when Holocaust survivor Sabrina Citrone sued for spreading false news. The entire government of Ontario joined the suit against the publisher of the document, Ernst Zundel, who was found guilty in 1988 of the charge, mostly because he couldn't provide any reliable proof of any of the claims found within. Making this a literal case of legally finding no provable basis for Holocaust denial. I will talk a bit more about Ernst Zundel in a bit, because in many ways he formed a template for bold truth speakers and free speech warriors of the future, namely Alex Jones. In 1977, Arthur Butts, a professor of electrical engineering in Evanston, Illinois, wrote The Hoax of the 20th Century, which would go on to become one of the most cited scripts by Holocaust denialists moving forward. He depicted Jews as villains who had taken control of society, inserting themselves into government and media. He depicted the extreme rhetoric of Hitler in speeches and letters as either fabrications or lapses in speech. He depicted the Holocaust myth as the fault of Zionist Jews and communists. He dismissed the testimonies of Nuremberg trials as being forced and tortured to further this conspiracy. Historians such as Jacques Kornberg have noted that there's no evidence for this torture Butts talks about in Nuremberg, and that he's likely confusing Nuremberg for other trials such as the Dachau Military Tribunal. From Deborah Lipstadt's book Denying the Holocaust, quote, although Jews were the instigators, they engineered this effort with the assistance of other forces. Together they formed a vast conspiratorial network that, despite the broad assortment of groups involved, managed to keep its existence a secret. According to Butts, all these vastly different forces were coordinated by Zionists, who nurtured the legend until it achieved the stature of an international historical hoax, a complex and convoluted process that involved multitudinous forces. It remained undetected, amazingly, until a professor of electrical engineering conducted his own brand of historical research." End quote. I fully recommend reading Deborah Lipstadt's Denying the Holocaust, which has intensive research discussing Butts and other writers, and most importantly, how they've spread fabrications as facts for decades to further their anti-Semitism and followings. In 1978, the Institute for Historical Review, a far-right organization dedicated to promoting and spreading Holocaust denialism and anti-Semitism, would be co-founded by Willis Cardo. 
Carter was a well-known racist who supported the elections of segregationist George Wallace and former KKK Grand Wizard David Duke. At the risk of citing one book too much, I want to read another passage from Denying the Holocaust because Deborah Lipstadt phrases this so much better than I ever could. Quote, Willis Carter's political vision is encapsulated by three things, contempt and revulsion for Jews, a belief in the need for absolutist government that would protect the racial heritage of the United States, and a conviction that there exists a conspiracy designed to bring dire harm to the Western world. The articles, journals, and books brought out by the Cardo nexus of publications consistently focused on predictable themes, the ignoble allied treatment of Nazi Germany, Jewish responsibility for the ills of the Western world, the grotesque misdeeds of the bastard state of Israel, and the existence of a conspiracy perpetrated by a high elite, consisting mainly of people with Jewish names to control American foreign and financial policy. Jews besmirch Germany's good name and support the communist attempt to impose their system on the Western world. At the heart of every serious problem facing the United States, civil rights, energy, defense, racial integration, are Jews manipulating matters for their own benefit. End quote. Willis Cardo often depicted his enemies, including conservatives who didn't agree with his fringe anti-Semitism like William Buckley, as paid off by the ADL, something still seen by conspiracists like Alec Jones today. In 1984, Canadian-German immigrant Ernst Zundel was charged by the government for distributing material he knew to be false, including Nazi revisionism and anti-Semitic books and pamphlets. He'd built an underground publishing empire and was prone to publicity stunts like appearing for his trial in a bulletproof vest and a hat emblazoned with freedom of speech and sending anti-Semitic materials to member of Canada's Congress. Zundel is still regarded as a free speech warrior for his guerrilla tactics, which would eventually include televised broadcasts where he would spread conspiracy theories and blatant neo-Nazi propaganda. His title of the voice of freedom seen displayed at the beginning of his tirades depicts a progenitor of talking heads like Alex Jones, who likewise wear their guerrilla journalism faux bona fides front and center, and depict their incoherent ramblings as a brave fight against the mysterious forces out to oppress the white man or the West or whichever group they claim is being victimized. It's whatever gets them the most monetary support from their fan base, really. David Duke would be elected to the Louisiana legislature in the 1980s. He was a vocal proponent of Holocaust denial, saying that Jews perpetrated the hoax for aid money and to shield Israel from criticism. The 1980s video boom would allow nationalists to upgrade from pamphlets and poor quality books to poor quality VHS tapes, like this 1987 documentary, Holocaust Revisionism for Beginners by David McCaldin. This documentary is a fascinating window into the fringe of the far right and how almost nothing has changed in how poorly sourced and vetted their arguments are. McCaldin was an associate of Willis Cardo, the founder of the Liberty Lobby and Institute for Historical Review we mentioned earlier. Another patron of the Institute for Historical Review would be Robert Farrison, a British academic who published Holocaust Revisionism. In 1983, he would be fined for saying Hitler never ordered or permitted the execution of anyone for their religion or race, something that is just incredibly untrue. Kind of weird how so many of these dorks congregate in the same circles, isn't it? In 1988, the Leuchter Report was published, which would become ground zero for several conspiratorial arguments. The Leuchter Report was commissioned by Ernst Zundel during his trial to prove Holocaust denial had a basis in reality. Fred Leuchter was an electrician who had used his expertise as an engineer on state prison execution methods like the electric chair to preface his report, which to the layman may seem like a reputable source. Who better than someone who knows execution methods to determine the reality of mass executions? Except Fred Leuchter wasn't an expert. Leuchter was in fact sued by Massachusetts for lacking any relevant qualifications and lying to get his job. Under oath in Ernst's trial, Leuchter would say he only ever had a BA degree and that his local colleges didn't offer engineering degrees when he was at college. This was unsurprisingly a lie, and it was found that Boston University offered three relevant degrees during his time there. He claimed to have received documents from the Auschwitz Museum themselves, yet that would later be denied by museum management. The Luther Report questioned Zyklon B as an agent to kill Jews and posited it as a disinfectant, or most brought into question the number of people that could be packed into a gas chamber or crematorium, with the conclusions being used to argue that the death of six million Jews were a statistical impossibility. However, the findings themselves were almost immediately called into question due to errors with sampling that would throw off any conclusions. For example, Leuchter hadn't informed the lab he hired to run samples of what the samples would be used to prove. As a result, they would grind samples of rock from concentration camps into fine powder before testing, which would completely throw off the conclusions Leuchter had reached in his report about how chemical weapons would adhere to surfaces over time. This is just one of the many, many examples of ineptitude and miscalculations that Leuchter confidently built his report around. Another fun example is him claiming under oath to be conferring with DuPont 
on a consultation regarding cyanide. DuPont denied even knowing the guy. Lukter wasn't a chemist or an educated engineer. His degree had been in history. Moreover, he was proven as a liar under oath multiple times. Every qualification he cited was entirely fabricated. And having no background in proper data and evidence collection and analysis, the samples he gathered amounted to little more than nonsense when his conclusions were published. Yet for decades, the Lukter report has been shared and spread as the great definitive proof of Holocaust denial. It's still cited today. This is just one of the many examples of how conspiracy doesn't adhere to facts. It doesn't listen to actual evidence or expert testimony. But that doesn't mean the rest of the world will play along, however. Enter Jean-Claude Prasak, originally a Holocaust denier who sought to visit Auschwitz to prove the Holocaust a myth. When he visited the camp in 1979, he was met with a bevy of evidence to the contrary. Originally consulting with Robert Forrison, Prasak would spend over a decade visiting the camp and studying in great detail archival maps and documents supplied by the museum staff there. Eventually, his work would culminate in a 1989 book that disproved conspiracies like those in the Lukter Report. Did this decade of intensive research based on first-hand documents and study disprove a plethora of half-baked books by conspiracists who rarely cited reliable sources? Not for those wanting to believe, but Prasak's work remains an important staple for Holocaust history nonetheless. British Holocaust denier David Irving would be convinced by the Lukter report that the gas chambers were faked. David Irving did his best to revise Hitler, simply using anti-Semitism for power, and essentially making the argument that Hitler wasn't that bad of a guy because his heart wasn't in the bigotry, it was just a tool for political power. Holocaust denial aside, I think he's almost onto something here. Something that strikes the core of many deniers and conspiracists in anti-Semitism. A thirst and hunger for power, at the cost of merely defining for their audiences a group to hate and persecute. I believe Hitler obviously did hate Jewish people, but it feels like Irving is so close to understanding why anti-Semitism has remained around as long as it has. And up to here we've discussed a lot of people, but I can't stress this is far from an exhaustive list. There are so many preachers, politicians, businessmen, failed scientists, and others who have latched onto these theories, and while most of them have died or languished in obscurity, they spread enough of their ignorance that it's still a problem today. One of the many ways ignorance and prejudice thrive is through debates like these people made, not well-reasoned or factually accurate, but full of half-truths that take more time to disprove than they do to say. Because for the people they're speaking to, they won't fact check. They'll accept theories about Jewish control and any facts to the contrary as orchestrated or brainwashing. And because their conspiracies grow so vast and elaborate, they can rarely be proven wrong, let alone understood by outsiders who actually know what they're talking about. For a long time, this tribalism led to conspiracists being regarded as crazies, kooks, crackpots. But the 1990s brought some slight changes to public perceptions. The late 80s would also see the start of Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell. Art Bell isn't an anti-Semite or Holocaust denier as far as I know, but Coast to Coast AM would become a focal point of late night conspiracy movements around the country, discussing everything from ghosts to aliens and more insidious things like the Illuminati, New World Order, and more. As we've seen, many of these conspiracies have basis in anti-Semitism, but by this point, so many aspects had been sensationalized that to the common observer, they appeared innocuous, even harmless to believe. Ideas like the Illuminati, banking groups, the Rothschilds, and the New World Order for the random normie just became white noise under a vast umbrella of conspiracy. Through the 1990s, there would be a bit of a conspiracy boom in pop culture. The X-Files, Twin Peaks, Men in Black, and more all played roles in ingraining images of special agents, black suits, and suspicious circumstances into the zeitgeist of American fantasy, making characters in suits and ties as iconic and immediately understood as archetypes like cowboys or pirates. Like Coast to Coast AM, these properties and more would play fast and loose with conspiracy theories for inspiration, telling stories about clandestine secret societies and backroom meetings, yet they serve to normalize the ideas of conspiracy nonetheless. Back on the conspiracist front, the 1990s would see the emergence of David Icke, a British conspiracy theorist who's publicly endorsed the protocols of the Elders of Zion, and Alex Jones. There is far too much to talk about regarding Alex Jones for this video. While he has over the years tried to distance himself from outright anti-Semitism, he continually is critical of the New World Order and has repeatedly pushed conspiracies about the Rothschilds, Bilderberg Group, ADL, George Soros, and other Jewish organizations as responsible for fomenting unrest. Alex is a liar and a grifter who over several decades on air has flip-flopped numerous times on his positions. He makes his money by sensationalizing headlines, blaming them on the New World Order or Democrats trying to control the populace. The only things he's been consistent about is shilling relabeled products to gullible viewers 
and the rapidly expanding circumference of his neck. He was finally called out by the parents of Sandy Hook children who died in a mass shooting after those parents were harassed for years when Jones painted the grieving parents as crisis actors and the tragic mass shooting as a plot to enact gun control. I don't want to talk too much about Alex because he's an idiot and makes me angry to think about, and he's uncomfortable to look at. I highly recommend the podcast Knowledge Fight, which over several hundred episodes has done a wonderful job of debunking Alex's various lies and contradictions. Like, seriously, if you've ever thought Alex Jones is even a little bit right about anything, please go listen to Knowledge Fight and educate yourself. However, if you're familiar with Alex Jones and more modern conspiracies, you likely also are familiar with George Soros, who in the 1990s was just gaining prominence on the world stage. From Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers, Quote, Soros was an emerging example of Jewish wealth in the 90s, but in the firmament of globalist controllers, he was still far below the Rothschilds and other stalwarts like the Rockefellers, Councils on Foreign Relations, Bilderberg Group, and of course, the Clintons. But that would finally start to change for good in December 1998, with an interview on the US magazine show 60 Minutes that delved deeply into his past, and contorted events of his childhood into a story that didn't reflect what actually happened. The stories Soros has told about living under Nazi rule tend to contradict each other and are often taken out of context, and none more so than here. In a bizarre sequence that would be used against Soros for the next two decades, journalist Steve Croft asked Soros if he felt survivor's guilt over making it through the Holocaust. Survival aided in part by posing as the godson of a Christian Hungarian civil servant. End quote. The interview mentioned here would proliferate a theory that George Soros aided the Nazis. In reality, Soros' family escaped using falsified documents, and George was 14 when the Third Reich fell. I can't imagine many kids that young were a big help to the Nazi regime at the time. Another prominent theorist from the time would be radio crank Bill Cooper, who wrote Behold a Pale Horse, a book espousing secret Illuminati plans for global domination, that a secret cabal was behind the Kennedy assassination, and plenty more anti-Semitic adjacent theories that built upon the anti-Semitic sentiments of conspiracists past without making Jews a focal point. Behold a Pale Horse is another in a long line of direct descendants to the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a half-baked screed meant to sow fear from ignorance, spreading fiction as fact. It would see a resurgence in fringe popularity in QAnon spaces, which just seems to be another step in the never-ending Jenga tower of conspiracy that reaches back decades. Along with scripts like None Dare Call It Conspiracy and Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, Behold the Pale Horse would prove foundational for modern far-right conspiracy and the militia and libertarian movements, unsurprisingly aided by being spread by commentators like Alex Jones. It's from these pages we get the modern landscape of conspiracy, an ever-shifting ideological minefield where there's always room for a new agenda. Because so many of these ideas come from places of anti-Semitism, it's easy to dispel notions of anti-Semitism or, as we will see soon, insert it back in to further bigoted doctrines. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars, before I forget, was reported to be an anonymously published manual about taking over the world. Unsurprisingly, that's not true. From Mike Rothschild's Jewish Space Lasers, quote, Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars was not a real government blueprint for world domination found by some random patriot in a surplus copy machine. Instead, it was likely written by a Pearl Harbor conspiracy theorist and sovereign citizen named Hartford Van Dyke. Responding to the document's printing in a 2003 issue of Paranoia magazine, Van Dyke wrote a letter to the editor claiming he wrote it in 1979 after being inspired by None Dare Call It Conspiracy, not as a paranoid manifesto, but as a politically biased technical information manual on how to justify and selectively survive human-animal husbandry before the need for human-animal husbandry becomes unstably critical. Notably, Van Dyke wrote to Paranoia magazine from prison where he was serving time for trying to pay his taxes with fake currency. Silent Weapons for Quiet Wars is far and away one of the goofiest conspiracy screeds when actually read. It's full of speculative conspiracies about social engineering and pseudoscience that reads like the makings of a solid psychological sci-fi thriller, except people took it seriously. While outright white nationalism slipped into the background, conspiracies about puppet masters, particularly focusing on George Soros and other billionaires, flourished in the mid-2000s, popularized by voices like Glenn Beck and the Tea Party movement, and in Europe by far-right figures like Viktor Orban. In these movements were the nascent nationalist origins that would lead to Trump, and the revival of more blatant racism and nationalism following his America First approach to politics during the 2016 election. George Soros has become the en vogue Jewish figurehead to hate for a while now. He's been called out by Trump, Tucker Carlson, Marjorie Taylor Greene, and was also cited by name by the Tree of Life synagogue shooter who shouted, all Jews must die before opening fire. 
The conspiracies around Soros are often easy to dispel, but that hasn't stopped them from being spread by the already converted across social media. Plenty of accusations and conspiracies acutely echo previous anti-Semitism, like Soros being the primary founder of the purported migrant caravan that was set to overwhelm and invade America's southern border. Sounds a lot like the fears spread about Jews undermining national interests in pre-World War II Germany, huh? Or how Soros was part of a New World Order plan to spread COVID and enact population control, which just seems straight ripped from plague-era superstitions of the Jews being responsible for outbreaks of plague. And the modern resurgence of open nationalism and extremism from politicians and commentators has only led to more blatant expressions of anti-Semitism, after people have been inculcated to believe things like the previously mentioned Soros conspiracies. The spread of such conspiracies has only been aided by the intersection of several concurrent movements like anti-vaxxers in the wake of COVID, and movements like QAnon depicting global elites, another phrase often used, though not exclusively, in conjunction with anti-Semitism as running an international satanic cabal. You may notice a few similarities in how these fascists of the past spread and justify their rhetoric to today's online right. From publicity stunt tactics that hide behind free speech to justify advocating violence, to blaming communists and perpetuating conspiracies that are aimed at destroying white culture. Unsurprisingly, the people obsessed with the Western culture of the past don't have any new ideas and keep regurgitating the same tactics. So then, let's look at today and how modern anti-Semitism and racism continues to grow in size and scope to the point where Nick Fuentes has been able to speak to a former president and have the ear of one of the most popular musicians in the world. Hello everybody, popping in here one more time to give another content warning. This section is going to show modern racism of all kinds in explicit terms and will likely be uncomfortable for some viewers. I have censored any slurs, but should still warn you this section has several minutes of Nick Fuentes talking which is a terrible thing for anyone to go through, but I feel it's important to understand just how grotesque his opinions are and contrast them with how he presents himself as a wrongly persecuted free speech warrior who just has some views that are politically incorrect. The reality is that he is a liar and an unyielding bigot, which is the goal of showing this footage. Nick Fuentes is a festering pustule on the underside of American politics. A far-right political commentator who got his start in his parents' basement, he wrote a wave of brief notoriety in the wake of the Charlottesville Unite the Right protest. Over the years, he stayed barely relevant with his America First movement online, not to be confused with Sebastian Gorka's American First, but you can confuse it with the early 1900s racism movements because Fuentes stands for many of the same things. Nick is a troll and provocateur who has managed to succeed on a surface-level image of polished eloquence that barely hides his smarmy, smug objective to simply piss people off. Probably the biggest reason he maintains relevance is his loyal army of basement-dwelling Pepe Avatar soldiers called Groypers, who can be found malding, coping, and seething in the mentions of any random marble statue Twitter account. As a presence, Nick is hardly unique on the fringe of the right that can safely include neo-Nazis like Red Eyes TV and unhinged conspiracy peddlers like Alex Jones. He's not a particularly gifted or engaging speaker, but he's competent, and as a pedantic debater, is able to convince his audience of his intellectual might with ease, mostly because they watch him to be convinced. You may be familiar with several stunts that have landed Nick in a wider spotlight, like getting Marjorie Taylor Greene as a speaker at his events. When Marjorie Taylor Greene was later questioned on Nick's anti-Semitism and racism, she claimed to not know who he was, which I actually believe. MTG seems like the kind of person to just see America first and trust the name on the box. More recently, though, Nick was also Kanye West's handler as he went around his ill-fated campaign for president, which mostly just included bizarre appearances on conservative podcasts and shows like Alex Jones and Tim Pool. Knowing Nick's history as a troll who slightly nods towards alt-right talking points like Holocaust denial, being against race mixing, and being against education for women is important to understand how he's managed to grow his presence and in turn how modern anti-Semitism continues to spread unabated. Because he really doesn't like to present any of those things up front. And the problem that is going on, if women want to work their whole life and never have kids, I don't think that's good for them. I don't think that's fulfilling. But worse still is you have women that are promiscuous, which is a mortal sin. They'll wind up having kids, often become a single mom. And even if they're not, the kids wind up in daycare. And the point is, is it's just a very selfish Like lifestyle. other fringe grifters, Andrew Tate or Alex Jones, Fuentes has made his reputation primarily for endorsing incendiary and somewhat violent rhetoric 
rhetoric that often plays to various right-wing concerns like modern dating, job opportunities, or financial struggles, while his audience is looking for someone or something to blame for those struggles. Let's look at a great example from this guest appearance he did on a podcast. When questioned about being a white nationalist, anti-Semite, racist, bigot, fecal smear, he doesn't own up to any of it. Nick Fuentes, known for holding anti-Semitic views and denying the Holocaust. That's what it says here. He's a far-right supremacist and political commentator and live streamer. He identifies as a member of the incel movement and as a supporter of authoritarian government and is a Catholic integralist. 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 I gotta learn how to read. And white Christian nationalist. Uh, in 2020, seeking to establish a white supremacist conference to rival CPAC, Fuentes began holding the annual America First Political Action Committee, AFPAC, um, Fuentes attended 2017 white supremacist rally in Charlottesville and later as the attendee of speaker events preceding the 2021 United States Capitol attack. Um, so there's a bio. Uh, how much of that is accurate? Uh, and here's your chance to write your own bio. Well, a lot of it's not true. Every time they say my name, they got to throw in white supremacist, white nationalist, anti-Semitic, neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't identify with any of those things. I'd say I'm a Catholic American nationalist. Instead, Catholic. simply portraying himself as a brave questioner of accepted truths who's been ostracized for speaking up where others simply dare not tread. Nick Fuentes has famously denied the Holocaust through several clever, cute bits where he merely jokingly nods to denial while pretending to be talking about something else, like cookies. And in addition, you know, in this hypothetical, I imagine that if you took aerial photographs over the kitchens, you would need to see certain smokestacks to release the smoke from baking the cookies and the smokestacks would project certain shadows, but I guess they're not visible in the aerial photographs taken over the kitchens. Moreover, if you look at the soil texture, it's really not deep enough for mass cookie storage underground. Um, and so there's a lot of things, you know, in the cookie kitchen, they say that the ovens are uh, wooden and they have windows on them and they're not totally secure. And the ovens that they use they, they actually did sort of an ad hoc use of that particular kind of oven, even though they made a perfectly good design for ovens for a different purpose, for delousing. I mean, you know, for something else. So none of it really... But aside from very thinly attempting to pretend like he's not talking about something while obviously talking about it, Nick loves to act like he's not actually a racist or white supremacist, mostly when he gets invited on podcasts or gets called out on his bullshit. But if he's not a white supremacist or an anti-Semite, why would he say this stuff? You know, take a wild guess why conservatives have been losing for a hundred years. It's because the conservative movement is full of atheists, Jews, and homosexuals. And the conservative movement is full of people exactly like this. And that's why the conservative movement is never going to save this country. I don't cons I won't even call myself a conservative for that reason. What we need is a real reactionary right-wing movement led by real Christians, real Americans, real right-wing people. Not all of these interlopers, and that's exactly what they are. Democrat to deplorable? Fuck you, okay? How about, how about just deplorable? How about just conservative? No, no Democrats, no liberal Jews from D.C. for crying out loud. Every time they say my name, they got to throw in white supremacist, white nationalist, anti-Semitic, neo-Nazi. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't identify with any of those things. And so, how am I the only person saying this? Like, I feel like I'm going crazy because this is just obvious. Everybody feels this way, but no one wants to... They don't want to say it, and they also don't want to admit it when I say it. When I say it, they go, you know, it's like Scarface. So there's a bad guy. Because, you know, the same black people that are the eternal victim, the same blacks that were saying, oh, they're poor kids, oh, they're poor this, they're inner city schools, the food ghettos, endless. And they're the ones that are robbing everybody in Chicago. They're the same ones doing heists. Enough already, enough already with this. Picking up after them picking up their garbage and uh, we're going to make these, uh, we have to pander more to them. Seriously? I mean, let's have a little bit of dignity. This used to be a great country. Now it's a trash heap and we got to get on our hands and knees and beg these people to appreciate what they've been given on a silver platter. I'm not going to do it. You know, I don't identify with any of those things. That's my favorite part of the whole story. 
it's not just that he's a black guy beating up his girlfriend. Like, no matter what you do with him, <laughs> you can put him in the U.S. Army advertisement. You can make him the star of the biggest, the biggest franchise, cinematic franchise in the history of Earth. Then you put him in an Oscar film as well. I mean, this guy's like supposed to be world famous. They're clearly setting him up to be a Denzel, Will Smith, whatever. You can take the n out the hood. You can't take the hood out the n I don't identify with any of those things. But people say, oh, well, he was a globalist. He was this universalist. He wanted the whole... Well, that's not quite true. He was making Germany great again in his own special way, in a more classical way, making the German nation if the German nation is considered as the German peoples, he was making that German nation great again. The reason people don't want to talk about that, the reason people can't embrace that, which is common sense and moral, is because people associate with a little guy named Adolf Hitler. Anytime you bring up ethnic nationalism, white nationalism, white identity, yeah, who do you think of? Adolf Hitler, the bad man, the bad man that killed all those people. Well, you know, I don't know, maybe it's a good idea that America should be white, but also by the same token, and that sounds like the bad guy. That sounds like the guy that I was taught, you know, from cradle to grave, that was the most evil person. You know, there can be no recourse about that. There can be no debate about that. I might say that's deliberate. Some might say that's deliberate. You might start to wonder, hmm, why is it illegal to question certain things in Europe? Why is it basically illegal to, to have a contrary opinion? How about those... 200 to 300,000 Jews that he mercilessly, mercilessly wiped off the face of the planet that we will never get back. How about those people? Makes me sick. It makes me sick when people when people lie about the, the most evil man in history. No, but in all seriousness, that's a joke, of course. That's a, a joke. We know that it, the number was closer probably to at least a billion. Um, but no, of course... I, why? Why do I, why do I just punish myself? I just do this to myself... But it's but I do it for you, the people, because it is funny. Um, but in all seriousness. Nick Fuentes, known for holding anti-Semitic views and denying the Holocaust. That's what it says here. And white Christian nationalist. I'm a I'm a polite, respectful person, and I treat everybody in a respectful way. I happen to have views that politically are totally against the system. This anti-Semitic neo-Nazi. You have this reputation. I identify with anti-Semitic neo-Nazi because I really believe them. 45 minutes ago, you threw a huge fit whenever anyone here brought up the accusations of you watching child porn. It's a little different. People call me a hypocrite for this. I mean, at the end of the day, what can a person do? Hitler. As the years pass and Nick gives greater looks into his personal life and beliefs, it becomes more clear what a disgusting little troll he is. He has recently defended friends of his who were found in ownership of child abuse materials. He has openly talked about trying to marry a 15 or 16 year old girl. He puts out this alpha Chad bro Trad Cath image that feels entirely like posturing for his legion of internet fans who have invested the entirety of their personality into picking fights on Twitter and yelling slurs in Call of Duty lobbies and his vaguely polished appearance and self-proclaimed cancelled status have earned him street cred for luminaries like Trump and Kanye West. Like them, Fuentes relishes a self-persecution complex, blaming others, in this case the Jewish-controlled media, for his own personal mistakes. He is constantly bemoaning being kicked off of PayPal and other payment services, being pushed off YouTube, and he presents those struggles for those unaware as political suppression, rather than the fact that he regularly just says stuff like this. I'm a misogynist, and I didn't choose that. I didn't choose to be born. I've never touched a woman in my life. I'm stone cold to somebody. Yeah, well, I don't even want that. So, I don't want touch. I don't want a relationship. You know what I want? Total Aryan victory. That's all I want. I didn't choose that. All I want is revenge against my enemies and a total Aryan victory. Hugs and kisses, touch, sappy stuff, hand-holding, please. All I want is revenge and an Aryan victory for my people. Nick Fuentes is not an intellectual and certainly not a serious person. 
Then why has he gained such a following? And how did that get him as far as having dinner with the former crime president? And basically becoming the handler of one of the biggest pop musicians in the world for a year? Because of the role he plays in the modern conspiracy ecosystem. Nick Fuentes may be one of the most well-known far-right provocateurs working today, but he's far from the only one. Having been banned from most mainstream and respectable outlets, he's forced to host his content on fringe sites like Gab, Rumble, and Odyssey, where lax content moderation rules allow for racism and conspiracy content to fester. For background, Andrew Torba, founder of Gab, has previously spread anti-Semitism, including calling Jews Christ killers and saying they're responsible for social degeneracy. So that's a good hint at why he'd like to create a space for free speech. Which brings me to the most worrying aspect of modern anti-Semitism and the JQ, how far it's spread and how. While many want to say people like Matt Walsh are Nazis for openly advocating violent suppression of their enemies and their fascist ideals, people forget that the Daily Wire isn't an extreme fringe of right-wing thought. Extremists in the alt-right, in fact, tend to hate the Daily Wire, largely because of Ben Shapiro, who's Jewish and his role as editor. Look, there's a problem with like all this transgenderism and like what is a woman and stuff. There, there, there is an issue there, but it's the lowest hanging fruit possible. You and know they don't I mean? touch Weimar, right? They, they right. don't touch the origin point. Who were the doctors who performed these first sex change operations and wrote the books on it? Who mm -hmm. wrote the manuals on transgenderism, as I got into in the other video? Right. So that's why, you know, this whole Daily Wire, Jordan Peterson, yeah, we need to get in there more and criticize them. Let their people know that, hey, there's this whole other fun party online that you need to know about that's actually giving you the, the whole enchilada. They, they talk about cancel culture and all these things, but these people, these guys that, uh, that took it from you, huh? Yes, yeah, uh, they're calling it the <laughs> genital wellness movement. Because this is happening. And you like, said, in America, said? it's high. And it was... on places like Rumble, Gab, and more, these theories about anti Semitism are allowed to proliferate with no pushback whatsoever. While the sites themselves were founded on ideas of no censorship or free speech, it turns out that usually just means racism and hatred in extremity. The communities cultivated around these sites, as a result, have formed their own networks extending across Telegram, Discord, 4chan, and 8chan, and Kiwi Farms. Networks where anti-Semitism flourishes, where once conspiracy theories were laughed out of academic circles and neo-Nazis had to rely on small publishers and mailing lists to maintain a presence, the rise of alternative spaces in the wake of rising reactionary movements since 2016 have given dedicated spaces for like-minded conspiracists and bigots to confer with one another, indulging a never-ending Ouroboros of confirmation bias as they regurgitate conspiracies back to each other. Uh, the thing is, I agree with you that it is Zionists but it's also bigger than that. Of course, there are Zionists that have infiltrated our government. The original point, our state to white people and Christians should have a seat at the table. This is our country. America is our birthright. This is a Christian nation. Europeans founded and built and settled. So let's just say that we're right. And I mean, obvi it's obvious that we're right. All you have to do is go look at Joe Biden's cabinet. Go look at the State Department, Victoria Newland. Look at Anthony Blinken. Uh, look at the media, who funds them? Where does BlackRock come from? How about Vanguard? How about State Street? Uh, how about the Rothschilds, who literally have funded every single military intervention that we've ever had in recent times? Okay, so let's just say that these Zionists or these Jews really are, you know, so some people would say, well, so what? But it's also that their, their values are fundamentally corrupt because they don't believe in Jesus Christ and because they don't have a universal religion, they see everybody else as animals and fundamentally, I think in a sense, they're they're communing with the devil. If you're not worshiping Jesus, if you reject Jesus and you put in place all this sort of occultic, mystical things about the devil and all of that, um, you know, it's no coincidence then why we have a society that's full of pornography and sex and sin and everything else. What it's lobby is involved with every single one of these things? Who's funding this? Who's defending all of this stuff? Then you can see that there is an obvious directional big freaking arrow pointed right at Israel and you're not allowed to ask those questions without being anti-semitic so because I'm doing this you know delving deep and deeper every I'm not a I'm not a Jewish expert I'm, I would love for a, a Jew to come on here and tell me why it's great that you know that that we have Jews everywhere inside of our government and, and all of our installations while our country is declining into shambles and it's almost unrecognizable an echo chamber where they aren't ever challenged or proven wrong. 
What makes this murky is that in this stew of fringe ideology, there's no guarantee that everyone hates all the same people. Look, for example, to Alex Jones, who regularly platforms anti-Semites and racists, who blames Jewish organizations like the ADL for the New World Order, but who still claims to not hate Jews and defends Israel. This approach is representative of many conspiracists who adhere to ideas about cabals, the Rothschilds, or Soros, but haven't fully committed to bigotry on an ethnic or religious scale. There's even diversity in these spaces. You're bound to find some black content creators, gay or even trans posters on these boards. But overwhelmingly, the attitudes fomented by these parts of the internet are exclusionary and increasingly radical and growing more active. It's parts of the internet like this that gave birth to Unite the Right in 2016, various militia groups and armed protests of events like Pride or Drag Queen Story Hour. Conservatives in the mainstream like Dinesh D'Souza may like to repeat the same lines like Democrats own slaves or liberals are the real Nazis, but time and time again, the most Nazi-like fringe groups lay closest to mainstream conservatism, and it's a growing effort that wants more exposure. As more radical, brazen conservative voices like Matt Walsh grow in influence and viciousness, these groups keep a fair distance but still pay attention to what they're saying. For example, What is a Woman is fairly well known in these alt-right circles and was essentially a rallying cry for the kind of people who want to scare children with guns because a drag queen read them a story. And in some parts of the country, these fringes have led concentrated efforts to get politicians who believe these conspiracies into office. It's no surprise that both Lauren Boebert and Marjorie Taylor Greene have both advocated for QAnon and other conspiracies in the past. In my personal neck of the woods, we've had concentrated efforts in places like Idaho to get members of hate groups into small government offices, like David Riley, who had no kids in the local school district, yet tried to run for the school board of Post Falls. Riley was at Unite the Right in Charlottesville and publicly espoused beliefs that would be familiar to fans of Nick Fuentes, like not wanting women to vote and, of course, anti-Semitism. Because in Idaho, we are a Christian people. We are a Christian state. We do not believe in abortion in Idaho. We do not believe in transgender bathrooms in middle school. We don't believe in pornography in the libraries, and we don't believe in giving uh, puberty blockers to kids, right? This is just way beyond the pale when it comes to Idaho values. There are other examples in the Pacific Northwest, like Matt Shea, a former state representative who had a group chat called the White Movement, taking influence from the pogrom-happy Russian factions of the early 1900s. Shea had openly talked about a coming civil war before being ousted, but now he runs a local hate church, On Fire Ministries, in Spokane. These are just a few examples of concentrated efforts from fringe actors to gain more power, and while they've been broadly ineffective so far, the right-wing proximity to hate movements has only grown closer, and so has their efforts to take over local elections, school boards, and other small-time government offices. It's representative of growing conservative movements to install people not based on any qualifications, but blatantly pushing agendas, like fighting transgenderism in schools. These growing efforts have allowed far-right propagandists to subtly push their hatred into the mainstream, like we've seen on Twitter, or even for people like Nick Fuentes, to have the uncritical ear of Donald Trump. These occurrences might seem fringe, but they are getting closer to the mainstream political complex all the time. Because of places like Twitter and Elon Musk's bid to create a free speech platform, more anti-Semitism is pouring out into the world after fermenting in the pandemic, inspired by opportunists looking to capitalize on the ongoing war in Gaza. While we don't yet have the outright advocating for violence you can find on Gab, Telegram, Rumble, and others, the conspiracy spaces on Twitter have allowed for plenty of spreading like this. Posts showing how many people with Jewish last names work in major companies, in governments, or in media corporations like Disney. These posts ignore the history of Jews in Hollywood, which during the golden years of film ran and funded some of the biggest films and companies. Why are there so many Jewish people in big business? Why are there so many Jewish lawyers in banks? A plethora of reasons, ranging from inherited wealth to historical factors we've now spoken at length about. And none of these reasons have anything to do with a concentrated conspiracy between hundreds of people from an infinite variation of backgrounds and life experiences just because they all happen to share either an ethnic or religious group. When people say certain billionaires are Jewish, they fail to draw a distinction between if that's ethnic or religion. Point these judgments towards any other group as an experiment. For example, if Jews are in control of the government, why do they only have nine Jewish senators? Meanwhile, there are 27 Catholic senators. Does that mean there's a Catholic conspiracy? According to Pew Research, Jews make up 6.2% of Congress, while Christians make up 878 
This is one of those cases I bet conspiracists would do their deflecting. They would likely look at the voting record of the Catholic senators. Are some of them in favor of aid to Israel? They can't just be voting the party line they're bought and paid for by Soros, the ADL, by Israel. Another point to consider is when these people are targeted, it's framed as though the Jewish CEO or whoever mentioned is the primary decision maker for companies with sometimes tens of thousands of people, which isn't how companies work. Investments and stocks are decided by boards, donations are often outsourced to dedicated foundations, and the companies are made up of various groups of people all with unique backgrounds and affiliations. These facts simply don't adhere to ideas that because Jewish people run some companies, those companies are part of a global Jewish plot. Think about this when you hear conspiracies that George Soros created Black Lives Matter. Assertions like this, parroted by everyone from Fox News to Trump, are accepted as fact, yet they're born from a different reality, and not one based in facts. They came from reports like a Soros Foundation philanthropic organization, the Open Society Foundation, donating $220 million to progressive efforts around the country to enact police reforms, to aid efforts for black voter awareness and registration, and criminal justice reform. But this domination came amid conservative panic during the George Floyd protests, lockdowns, and allegations that mask and vaccine mandates were stripping freedoms away. So it became easy to portray an effort for social justice by a scary-sounding foundation as part of a globalist plot. And because it was a foundation founded by Soros, that has since morphed into Soros-created BLM, Soros tried to burn down America. Or take, for example, any number of modern conspiracies based in age-old blood libel fears. Recently, even a Chabad in New York was found to have illegally expanded their tunnels under the synagogue. There is, of course, a non-conspiratorial reason behind the tunnel, and a noted history of this particular Hasidic synagogue defying local codes and regulations. But none of that matters to the anti-Semites on Twitter who immediately pounced on the occurrence as proof positive of human trafficking. The most rabid conspiracists would then try to link cases over a decade old of child abuse in an unrelated synagogue. See, this happened in 2009. Look at the conspiracy. But again, look at the larger conversation to be had. Child abuse and trafficking are very serious issues, but they are by no means limited to Judaism. There have been abusers in every place of worship of every religion, and they continue to seek out places like that because of the protection given, for example, in Orthodox Judaism, which has historically been very insular. What should be the conversation here is why do so many religions have this issue? Why are so many people protected from consequence? It has to do with the power structures formed around places of worship and beliefs, but interrogating that would be much harder for these conspiracists than it is to simply spread ignorant fear. But knowing the truth behind these conspiracies makes one wonder, why are these conspiracies being pushed? I mean, who does it really benefit to spread these social contagions, anti-Semitic or otherwise? Yeah, there are a lot of Jewish people in positions of power, but that's also changing, not because of anti-Semitism, but because demographics are changing all the time, and also because of efforts for diversity. For example, in 2021, 40 Fortune 500 companies had CEOs of Asian descent or background, far more than the six that were run by black people. Does that indicate an Asian-led conspiracy? Or is it because of a difference between the histories of groups and the opportunities afforded them in America? You won't see the people spreading these conspiracies drawing these kinds of distinctions because they challenge the core of their assertions that Jews are united by their Jewishness in whatever nefarious goals they wish to achieve. The reality is that some Jewish people throughout their history have been in advantageous positions due to their familial placement and proximity to wealth, like many other minority groups and unlike some others. But again, this proximity to wealth doesn't come close to applying to all Jewish people. Jewish people, like any other group, have been white collar, blue collar, and every other collar. And as that has changed over time, it will continue to change. It's not evidence of some grand conspiracy. It's also worth bringing up that Jewish people, like other groups that immigrated here and faced racism in the 18 and early 1900s, including groups that were seen as predominantly Catholic, like Italians and Irish people, have seemingly faced a kind of Schrodinger's racism, where they are included in whiteness when it's convenient for anti-Semites, but still held as distinct and worse because they're from an outgroup of non-pure, non-white stock. Racism against Irish and Italian people has obviously quelled over time because it's dumb, yet anti-Semitism thrives, and we've charted specifically how in the last hundred years. It's easy for modern anti-Semites to ask the Jewish question, and ask why there are so many Jews in power and lean into tropes to depict any number of disproven theories about world domination, because they don't know the history of their own arguments. Now that we've looked at it all, though, I feel the proper thing to ask isn't why are there so many Jews in advantageous positions? 
The thing people should be asking is, who gains the most by spreading these conspiracies? One of the reasons I went through such an exhaustive look at Jewish history and the history of anti-Semitism is because when viewed in totality, it doesn't just show a trend of Jewish people being targeted as the nearest scapegoats for social ills, but a trend of those accusing them using prejudice to consolidate and gain followings. The prejudices against Jewish people were forced upon them. The superstitions surrounding them are based on nothing but fears of the outsider. And through time, these filtered across borders to become conspiracies like those in the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Anti-Semites like to say, Jews have always been persecuted for good reason, and will beckon to look at the history of how Jews have been persecuted as proof that they're no good. They will hold up the persecution itself as proof of Jewish people's wrongdoing rather than the reasons actually given for the persecution. The problem with this is that when you truly examine that history, you'll find Jews being blamed for different things every time. For murder, for the bubonic plague, for stealing money despite being forced into money handling and loaning, for undermining societies despite often being forced to the outskirts of it, for spreading degeneracy while also being devout servants of their faith, for infiltrating governments, for stealing and trafficking children. There's no consistency to why the Jews have been persecuted. There never has been but there is consistency between the people pointing to them. Since the very first conspiracy theories were spread in the English countryside about blood libel that would make their way into Russian czarist anti-Semitic propaganda, that would work its way into the writings of Hitler, that would work its way to Ernst Zundel's trial in Canada, Jewish people have been used as scapegoats to blame for political and social issues that run far deeper. Look at the plethora of politicians, conspiracists, cranks, and various anti-Semites who kept virulent and Nazi rhetoric alive between World War II and the new millennium. They were laughed out of academia, proven wrong with facts at every turn, and they only ever advanced in life by appealing to likewise-minded bigots, by affirming the superstitions and conspiracies held by the ignorant, factual or not. Bigotry is profitable. If you can find an audience and continue feeding their insecurities, you'll have an endless drip feed of ego boosts and financial support because you're going after the people really responsible for everything you'll say. The supporters of people of all degrees of radicalism, from Fuentes to Trump, will define outgroups as responsible for almost everything, from our wars, our economic anxieties, the price of groceries, the list goes on. If modern politics can teach us anything, it's that people don't want complicated answers to complicated issues. They want easy answers, an answer that gives them someone or something to hate that won't make them question what they know. It's why conspiracies, including anti-Semitism, have gotten as far as they have. For some people, it's easier to believe that a satanic cabal is controlling the world instead of believing that our politicians don't care about us, that they would rather side with Wall Street and lobbyists than their voters. It's easier to believe that the New World Order is turning kids trans instead of accepting loved ones. Easier to believe CRT is being forced to make white people ashamed instead of believing the violent and bigoted history of America. It's easier to believe that vaccines are unsafe and sterilized and that COVID is a hoax than it is to accept that both parties and government stood by and did nothing, resulting in hundreds of thousands of preventable COVID deaths. It's easier to blame Jews and banks and billionaires for orchestrating James Bond villain plans for 15-minute cities and microchips and mind control than it is to realize that our society has been broken by the capitalism we were told made America exceptional for so long. These reasons are why conspiracies need to change ever so slightly to account for new undeniable facts. They shift goalposts. First, COVID was a conspiracy to make Trump look bad. Then it was overblown by China-owned media. Then it wasn't happening at all. It was all a bid to inject people with microchips. So the next time you see someone spreading any conspiracy, look into what they have to gain. Even these simple Twitter accounts, they spread misinformation in exchange for clout, raising their numbers and therefore influence in the hopes of reaching the exalted influencer status of a Libs of TikTok or a Jackson Hinkle, speaking of anti-Semitism. And all of these conspiracists are simply looking for an audience to take advantage of, to tell them who is really to blame. Which is why we see so many people, including parents, grandparents, and other close family, falling into these rabbit holes more and more. The world can be nonsensical. Why do so few people have so much while others suffer with so little? Why are some people born not having to work while others barely see their families and can't make rent working full time? And even for those who don't pay attention to politics, who don't go home and turn on CNN or Fox News, these inconsistencies in the world around us don't make sense. 
So we use conspiracy. We use these exciting stories that give us someone to blame for complex issues to make sense of it all. Which brings me to my final point, because while I hope I've proven or at least given you enough information to seek out additional research and resources for yourself to realize how laughable anti-Semitism is, I need to talk about why explicit anti-Semitism in particular has spread so much in the last year, going far beyond cloaked language about George Soros and New World Order control. The reason we have more outright singling out of Jewish people in conspiracies about controlling media and the government on mainstream websites like Twitter is because of what is currently happening in Gaza. And here I want to give one final major content warning. As we discuss Palestine and the Gaza war, I will be showing news footage of the Hamas attack, photos of the devastation in Gaza, and other depictions of wartime suffering. This is a highly contentious issue, and these photos, I feel, are integral to understanding the gravity of devastation in Palestine. Additionally, the footage featured in newscasts does not feature any dead bodies, but I feel it is important to depict Hamas's terrorism on October 7th for what it is, a violent, monstrous spree from a deeply evil terrorist organization. Viewer discretion is advised. Before talking about the modern conflict in Palestine, I need to talk a bit about the history of anti-Semitism in the Middle East and across various Arab countries throughout history. Remember when we talked about the Jewish diaspora that spread to Europe? Well, like I mentioned, Jewish people would settle all over, including Africa and the Middle East. And in many places, Jews and Muslims lived perfectly fine in harmony for hundreds of years. During the rise of Islam in the 7th century, the Jewish people who settled in those regions would fall under Islamic law. However, much like under Christianity, there were varying attitudes towards Jews for hundreds of years depending on who was in power. And, like under Christianity, Jews would eventually be targeted as an outgroup in the region. Pogroms took place such as in Fez in 1033 and Grandia in 1066. When Christian missionaries came to spread Christianity to the Middle East, in the 1800s they brought with them anti-Semitic conspiracies, as seen in a case of blood libel in Damascus in 1840. Keep in mind, many of these conspiracies and stereotypes about Jews were not seen in the region before this. They were brought over from Europe. Jews in the region lived there for a thousand years without conspiracies about blood libel. Along with these conspiracies came nationalism and scapegoating Jewish people for political upheavals. For example, in the 1908 Turkish Revolution, a new constitutional regime came to power to control the Ottoman Empire, and the opposition party blamed secret Jewish organizers. As the beginning efforts of Zionism saw some Jewish people emigrating back to the Middle East, conspiracies would begin to spread that they were seeking to erase the local Muslim population. The 1930s would bring allyship with Hitler to radical Muslim groups, including in Tunisia. Growing nationalism would see 950,000 Jewish people forced from the region, something that is often overlooked in the shadow of the Holocaust. Yet these mass expulsions, built on hundreds of years of growing enmity, would form the basis of Israel's post-World War II desire to have a haven for Jewish people in the Middle East. Nazis used propaganda to appeal to Arab countries who also shared disdain for the colonialism they'd experienced under Germany's enemies, France and Britain. After World War II, Nazis would collaborate with regimes like Syria, and some leaders even expressed admiration for Hitler, such as Anwar Sadat. A movement to unite the Arab world began called Pan-Arabism, and it shouldn't be surprising, this was a ethno-nationalist movement that targeted outsiders, like Jews. Gamal Abdel Nassar, who was president of Egypt from 1954 to 1970, was a major proponent of this movement and even spread the Protocols of the Elders of Zion as anti-Semitic propaganda. After World War II, the Ottoman Empire was partitioned, and Britain was given control of the area that is now Israel and Palestine. For thousands of years, this area had been home to predominantly Arab populations, but throughout the Islamic and Ottoman empires, the borders were largely open, including to Jewish people. In 1917, Britain signed the Balfour Declaration, announcing support for the creation of a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Discussions around this declaration would take place with well-known Zionist movement leaders from around the globe, but notably without Arab representation from the region. From 1920 to 1948, this region would be called Mandatory Palestine. In 1947, the UN attempted to enact a plan that would create a Jewish state and a Palestinian state in the region. Amid the growing pan-Arabism in the area, however, this measure had Jewish support, but not support from local Arab leaders. In 1948, efforts would renew to re-establish a safe country for the Jews. Britain would relinquish its control of Palestine, and a day later, Israel proclaimed statehood. The problem was, those Palestinian people still lived there in the areas the Jews claimed as a return to their ancestral homeland. And when people talk about how complicated the situation with Israel and Gaza is, this is what they mean. While this was originally seen as a victory for Jewish people after the unimaginable horrors of World War II, 
It was the beginning of what Palestinians would call the Nakba, or disaster. In the years following, struggles between local Arab leadership and Israel and Britain would break out as Jews began claiming more of the Arab land and over 700,000 Arab civilians were displaced. The 1948 Palestinian War would become known as a central part of the Nakba, and over time Israel's government would claim more and more territory originally delineated to Palestinians, using homes and property to settle more Jewish families. These borders would shift and change, with various sides and factions gaining and losing ground dozens of times over the next decades. This perception is where we see the roots of the modern conflict and a lot of anti-Israel and anti-Zionist sentiment. After studying so much, I have a hard time saying Israel and Jewish people around the world aren't entitled to a safe homeland. But the way the current Israeli government has gone about it in decades since, with a reckless disregard for the people who were living there for thousands of years, kicking them off of their own land and homes to create essentially an ethnostate, is impossible to deny. That's not even talking about the false imprisonment, restrictions on water and resources, torture, and imprisonment of, that Palestinians often suffer. Egypt would be the first Arab-led Middle Eastern country to recognize Israel after signing the Egypt-Israel Peace Treaty in 1977. In 1993, Israel signed the Oslo Accord with leadership of the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which would lead to the establishment of the Palestinian National Authority, which was a highly contentious development. The PNA would exert partial autonomous control over parts of the region, including the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. There are so many small incidents, uprisings, and developments from this point to the modern Gaza conflict, such as the First and Second Antifada, which were Palestinian-led revolts against the Israeli government. Hamas, a radical Islamic group, would manage to overtake Palestine's elections in 2007 and quickly outlawed further elections, cementing them as essentially the main governing group on the Gaza Strip. Hamas would soon after kill political party opposition leaders and anyone also suspected of helping Israel with very little proof needed. Which brings us to where the region is today. The hardest part about the ongoing Israel-Gaza war as an outsider is knowing how much the history of struggle means to both sides and how much worse this conflict is likely to get. Prejudices on both sides are only cemented by further violence. Hamas saw their attack as an uprising against tyranny. It's easy as an outsider to say they're terrorists. I mean, how is murdering and kidnapping women and children a cry for help or freedom? It's not so easy to put yourself in the shoes of a people who have spent generations under occupation, who have been victim to countless open war crimes by the Israeli military who, due to the support of Western governments and Islamophobia, have paid no price for their brutality. Yet, it is easy enough for the government of Israel, led by a far-right nationalist, to declare an open war in the name of defense, and the world has stood by and watched as now 23,000 Palestinian civilians have been killed. After the horrendous Hamas attack on October 7th kicked off the latest and most brutal campaign of violence in this long-running conflict, far-right and far-left agitators and anti-Semites have used this war as an opportunity to spread more of their intolerant conspiracies. Conspiracies that Israel, as a Zionist organized government, has infiltrated and taken over Western governments that what they're doing to Palestine will happen to the world, that this campaign proves right all the terrible conspiracies over the years. Along with these various conspiracies have been efforts to undercut Hamas's massacre on October 7th, portraying the slaughtering of innocent civilians as less than reported or manipulated, in the process portraying Israel as an even worse bully. None of this is true. I've mentioned it several times, but despite what conspiracists want to say, Jews are not a unified group. There are Jews in Israel who are against their government's treatment of Palestinian civilians. Democracy now. Those are the words written on signs held by young Israelis in the streets of Tel Aviv on Saturday. Waving rainbow flags and carrying torches, thousands of protesters marched against Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's new government, considered one of the most right-wing in the country's history. There have been concentrated and massive protests in Israel against Netanyahu even before the October 7th attacks. There are Jewish faith leaders and politicians the world over who have called for a ceasefire. Jewish activists play a role in movements like the Palestinian BDS effort, which seeks to call attention to the human rights abuses suffered by Palestinians under Israel's occupation. Especially as tensions are high during an election season in the United States, it's catnip for conspiracy theorists who can use headlines like Joe Biden's recent escalation from firing missiles at Yemen in defense of Israel to depict him as a vicious warmonger bought and paid for by the New World Order. Understandably, feelings run high. 
It has to be hard as a Jewish person, within a hundred years of the Holocaust, to see a group like Hamas extolling openly genocidal and racist rhetoric. There are Holocaust survivors alive today who witnessed Hamas's attack. For Jewish people, a group so besieged throughout time to see such a massive outbreak of brazen violence against them can surely only call to mind the events that led to a systematic extermination of six million people. Israel's government is currently far right. Despite what their propaganda claims, Netanyahu's government is not a safe haven for diversity, but an aspirational ethnostate, one that unifies its military and police under the teachings that Palestinians are subhuman, and one led by a man who has designs to take all of Palestine's territory back. By people I've spoken to who live in Israel, Netanyahu is seen as a power-hungry political chameleon, who will do anything for support and who has always had nationalist tendencies. These efforts to oppress Palestinians aren't Jewish in nature. They aren't inherently tied to the people of Israel. They come from the nationalism of its far-right government. Palestinians are routinely mocked on social media, even as their homes and belongings are stripped from them. And this isn't during wartime. This is just what their life is like. People who have lived in these areas for decades, whose families have been there for generations, are forced out because of their heritage. On the subject, I enjoy these hopeful words from an optimistic LA Times write-up of Benjamin Netanyahu in 2022. Quote, The Israel of the future must turn away from the ugly face of Jewish supremacy that is ascendant today. This means that although Israel can and should remain a homeland for Jews, it must not be, as the 2019 nation-state law declared, exclusively so. It must be a homeland for Palestinians who have lived in the land for centuries. In addition, it must acknowledge the searing pain of displacement and exile that Israel's establishment brought upon Palestinians in 1948, as well as the ongoing dehumanization of the occupation that began in 1967. And it must commit to full political, social, and economic enfranchisement of Arab citizens of the country. End quote. Netanyahu has managed to amass popular support while being openly racist against Arab states and people. His party has members who are students of anti-Arab hate groups. He has turned to supporting anti-LGBTQ measures and bigots and has made extensive efforts to spread propaganda and control news, especially during this conflict. These are all facts. The world has seen the result of far-right nationalism during the conflict as films circulate of Israeli military destroying property for laughs. And the United States, because Israel gives us an important political foothold in the region, has continued enabling this cruelty and now escalated to a point that threatens to draw us into another conflict, possibly even a global one, as the struggles in Ukraine and Russia churn onward. And after studying so much of the history of anti-Semitism, I can't look at all of Jewish history and imagine this is what the people who envisioned a safe homeland for the Jewish people wanted. To see the traditions of their faith and heritage turn to nationalism, used by demagogues to unite military force against a common enemy like so many before them. To build a homeland on the bones of others. And yet when I see people with an Israeli flag in their bio calling anyone who wants a ceasefire anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic, or racist, it's not too hard to understand why. They're buying into a conspiracy, buying into propaganda they've been fed. Because it's easier to believe people support terrorists like Hamas than it is to believe Hamas wouldn't exist in its current state without Israel's occupation. This happens on the left too, where it's easier for people to believe Hamas are freedom fighters against the far-right Israeli government than it is to see Hamas as the bloodthirsty, monstrous terrorists that they are. This is why tone policing Jewish people online and openly harassing Jewish people isn't a very good form of pro-Palestinian activism. Because even if unwittingly, attacking Israel instead of defending Palestine allows for bad faith actors to flourish and just makes Jewish people feel unsafe. I don't know how to end this conflict. If it were so easy, it would be done. If this was something easy to have an opinion on, it wouldn't have taken this long to get here. But I do know that only suffering can be gained by supporting open and violent nationalism. Israel has a right to exist, but the history of the Jewish people should demand that existence necessitate fair and equal treatment of all groups in its borders. Yet the right wing in control would rather have oppression that explodes into open carnage than peaceful coexistence. So there's not a lot I can do except to say that Palestinians deserve to live free of persecution. The hundreds of thousands of civilians displaced by the war don't deserve the brutal Hamas regime to begin with, and they don't deserve to die because of a war they have no control over. 
The ongoing Israel-Gaza war has presented a ripe opportunity for anti-Semitism to flourish again. The Netanyahu regime's open brutality seems to translate age-old superstitions to fact for the easily convinced, showing just how manipulative and evil the monstrous Jews really are. Like all conspiracy, it's a facade being spread by people who have something to gain through anti-Semitism. There are so many Jewish people who disagree, who want peace and a ceasefire. Like there have been throughout history, there are Jews who will be forced to endure violence and prejudice because of stereotypes forced on them. And the war in Palestine is simply the latest justification to point and blame Jewish people for the world's ills, for things they have no control over. Yet, just like every time throughout history, I believe that people of faith, not just in God or higher powers, but in decency and the desire to learn and coexist with one another, will persevere. As the Jewish singer-songwriter Debbie Friedman said in a song based on a verse from the book of Zechariah, Not by might nor by power, but spirit alone, shall we all live in peace. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for sticking around to the end of this video. If you follow me on here, Twitter, Instagram, or pretty much anywhere else, including streaming, you'll know I have been working on this video nonstop for over a month. And if the variety of sources and the massive list of academic sources and articles uh, in the description of the video wasn't any indication, this has been a absolutely seismic undertaking for me. I originally had planned to release this video about halfway through January, but the expanding scope of what I felt needed to be mentioned necessitated that it take this long. To that end, I would like to say that because of so much controversial material, this video is very likely to get extremely limited ads. So if you appreciate this video, please share it, please like it, leave a comment, help the algorithm boost it in any way possible. And of course, there are links down below where you can help fund my next big projects, including a upcoming video on the alt-right ties of the Satanic Temple and another massive undercover investigation I am doing at the end of February. Additionally, supporting me on Patreon gets you listed alongside all these groovy people right here and uh, Discord access for the $3 tier and up, including some fun little other prizes that I am, I am working on currently. With all that being said, I want to send a deep and heartfelt thanks to members of my community, especially the Jewish members of my community who have helped me edit and corral this massive work into something that I hope everybody can be proud of me for. I feel so honored to be given a platform where I am able to speak about these issues with the depth and complexity that they deserve, and I hope that you will all continue to join me on this journey as I uh, keep going down that path. With all that being said, I want to thank you all for watching, and I hope you have a wonderful day.